Good morning and welcome. My name is Leslie Chambers. I'm the president and CEO of the American Parkinson Disease Association. And on behalf of everybody here at APDA, I want to thank you for joining us for the fourth annual Midwest Parkinson's Congress, this year hosted by the Greater St. Louis, the Midwest, and the Oklahoma chapters of APDA. We are looking forward to engaging with people from all over the country. So please share your name and where you are joining us from in the chat box below. And during the program, we'll get to all your questions on the chat box. Every day, we provide the support, education, and research that will help everyone impacted by Parkinson's disease live life to the fullest. We're excited for you to hear from all of our wonderful and outstanding expert speakers today. We hope you leave this event feeling empowered on your journey. Oh, I see that some of those uh, posts are coming in the chat box. That's great. So throughout the program, we'll be getting back to you on the chat. And now I'd like to thank our sponsors who've helped make the Midwest Parkinson's Congress possible. Let's all give a big thank you to our presenting sponsor, the James and Allison Bates Foundation, and our champion sponsors, the JCA Charitable Foundation and Synovian. I'd also like to thank our collaborator sponsors, AbbVie, Acadia Pharmaceuticals, Adamus, Amnio, Boston Scientific, Delta Dental of Missouri, Kiawa Kieran, and Medtronic. Thank you all so much. Please take time today to visit our sponsors' resource pages so you can learn more about how they support our Parkinson's community. And don't worry, when you visit a sponsor, you won't miss out on a single minute of the excellent presentations as all of the sponsor pages will have the conference broadcast live. And finally, I would like to give a big round of applause to our fantastic production team, and our dedicated staff and volunteers who produced this wonderful event. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jill Stein, daughter of Elliot and Marianne Stein, who has joined us today to introduce the Stein keynote speaker. Have a wonderful event. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jill Stein, and I am the proud daughter of Elliot and Marianne Stein. To honor their legacy of community involvement, in conjunction with the APDA Greater St. Louis chapter, my brothers and I created the Elliot and Mary Ann Stein Speaker Series to make health and wellness information accessible to our friends and neighbors. On behalf of the Stein family, it is my pleasure to welcome Heather Kennedy, the 2021 Elliot and Mary Ann Stein keynote speaker. Heather is the founder of Kathleen Kiddo, an advocacy site offering Parkinson's disease resources and connections through social media. She is a motivational speaker, writer, blogger, visual artist, and mother of two. Diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in 2012, after many years of misdiagnosis, she works to raise awareness about the disease and especially the challenges that living with Parkinson's presents. We are so grateful to Heather for joining us today to share about her Parkinson's journey and how she finds the courage to live life to the fullest with Parkinson's disease. Thank you so much, Jill. Thank you for having me, APDA, and it's great to be here. If you've seen the movie Life is Beautiful, you probably remember a scene in which Roberto Benigni pretends he understands German so that he can delight his son in Italian. He's created a little game of alternate reality for the boy in which their trip to a Nazi concentration camp is actually fun. It's a game where he wins popsicles and lollipops. If you haven't seen this film, I recommend you find a way to remedy that because it's transformative, amazing. It's filled with reminders of powerful courage in the face of obvious doom. That's courage. I also think courage is the 24-year-old equities trader who was working on the 100th floor of the South Tower when 9-11 happened. He chose to re-enter the building four more times. Three times he carried people out and he was found just 25 feet from the entrance six months later. We're talking about courage, not heroism, not extraordinary circumstances, not even a temporary sense of bravery, where you charge into the street high on adrenaline to push your kid out of the way of an oncoming car. That too is meaningful, but 
it isn't the same as courage. Bravery comes and goes. It isn't always paired with wisdom or integrity. You can be brave and reckless. You can be brave and dangerous. You can be brave and kind of dumb. But courage, that's a lifestyle. And that's found in integrity. We need more courage in the world and more integrity. If you want to live a full life with Parkinson's, you need support. You need medication. You need workouts. You need to reassess your priorities. The biggest thing you need, though, is courage. Without that, none of the other stuff means a thing. I know this wasn't in your plan. If you're here today, you've been completely annihilated by this unfathomable, unpredictable, and cruel mercenary. It has a very polite name, like Parkinson's. Sounds genteel, doesn't it? You know, like those Parkinson's, are, they're such pleasant neighbors. Let's have them over for bridge and cocktails. Meanwhile, in reality, we're being dismantled from within. As my friend in New Zealand, Andy, likes to call it, Parkinson's makes us smaller. It is a smaller condition. It erases us. It makes us dimmer, quieter. It hunches us, shakes us, makes us slower, unsteady, unbalanced. It can make us depressed, anxious, and maybe apathetic. Like nothing at all matters anymore. I mentioned life is beautiful because it's a massive mental game. Like the Nazi, Parkinson's is threatening to put a bullet in your head. You know it means that it will happen sometime, maybe sooner than later, but there won't be much you can do about it. So you make it bearable for yourself and your loved ones with however much time you have before the psychopath and the pistol wakes up on the wrong side of the bed and your only resources are inside the head that has a gun against it. So you use them. It's always you against you. Your limits will be tested. You think for one moment that you're not courageous. If you've even survived one year with Parkinson's, you've got this all wrong. You have courage. You must. Or you wouldn't have gotten out of the house today. I'm imagining you left your house at some point this week. Without courage, you wouldn't be able to endure the frustration of finding yourself unable to tie your shoes or clean your kitchen. It takes courage to ask for help. To be your own advocate in a world that doesn't get it in a medical situation and an establishment that probably won't take care of you the way that you thought they would, this is how we become like the kings and queens of the jungle of life with Parkinson's. When I woke up this morning, I was completely frozen. I had to roll out of bed like, looking like some kind of wounded turtle on sedatives. I actually took a trazodone instead of my cinnamon because you know they're the same shape and roughly the same color. Just kidding. I made a cup of coffee, which took 20 minutes because it turns out that opposable thumbs, they're necessary for function, and both of my thumbs were locked in a dystonic cramp. It seemed to last until the moment that I connected just now with you here. So let's talk for a moment about what the APDA is doing for you. Were it not for the quarantine, we'd be here together in person. We'd enjoy mirror neurons and jokes and slapping each other on the back and maybe some hugs and handshakes. Eyeball to eyeball, wouldn't that be nice? Typically when I travel, instead of doing things virtually, I learn everything about the city. So I decided to make some tea wraps and put on the cards and see what I could do there. And if the Lord is willing and the crick don't rise, we'll end up at Ted Dawes for some custard maybe or something like that, you never know. Someday, we all prefer to be in person. We enjoy body language and the nuances and the humor. Humor is very difficult to translate through text. Aside from courage, your best offensive game with Parkinson's is your sense of humor. I've been accused of mocking disability. And I won't pretend that some pious weirdo won't do the same thing to you if you do this, but I suggest that these people who take things too seriously are to be pitied. If you can't muster pity, you can light some dried sage, you know, and smudge the place and get their energy out. Laughing at ourselves is a completely healthy coping mechanism, and many would tell you an utter necessity, whether you live with a progressive disability or just the usual disability that is aging and mortality. So ignore whomever you need to, to get on with the important business of pretending the Nazi of disability is challenging you to a game. You'll lose points if you cry. I've become an expert at unintentional sight gags, impro improvisation out of necessity. I recommend you find humor whenever possible. You can even start saying Irish wristwatch to warm up your voice if you like. Nobody's gonna understand you and what difference does it make? The healthiest response to humor and consistent loss in neurologic diseases and neurodegenerative diseases is this. We are in fact in control of nothing except our responses and isn't it true whether you have Parkinson's or not? 
we aren't in control. That's a good thing. My father, who had what I now realize was Parkinson's induced dementia, used to be quite the joker. We lost that joker for many years when he was sick and we would see moments of levity and we got so excited because they would shine through. He'd be himself momentarily. My youngest brother was helping my dad in the bathroom one day when my dad looked up at the light streaming through the window. I mean, it was a real <sighs> precious moment. My brother thought, this is where my dad's going to offer that advice to his son. This is the moment. My father looks up at my brother, Jared, and he puts his hand on his shoulder and he says, Jared, and Jared's really emotional. He's almost got tears in his eyes. And then my dad says, you're going to hell. And he laughs hysterically and slaps his knees, exits the bathroom, leaving my brother with his mouth open saying, well, he's probably not wrong. But how delightful to see our father again, even so temporarily. Never lose your sense of humor. Even if you forget how funny life is while you're in pain, if the intensity of the pain gets too much, don't forget, this doesn't have to get us down. You know, gravity does a good enough job at that. Let's let gravity do its thing. Acceptance is also necessary. Go or be dragged as the saying goes. <laughs> but I'd like to suggest that we do not need to drag ourselves down or others around us. I'm not saying, oh, just be more stoic or you know, create more joy or just deal with it. Far from it. If you have an opportunity to create joy around you and it benefits everyone, including yourself, go for it. Try to find the things that bring you gratitude and joy, whatever that may be. It's okay to be happy even when you're ill, by the way. It's lucky we're all gonna have PD for the rest of our lives. And if you can find some levity, go for it. You have the right to be happy and to find pleasure and joy. You have the right to be goofball. You don't need to be Eeyore for everyone to take care of you or support you. You don't need to be Eeyore so that everyone won't think that you're faking all this nonsense. You simply don't. We all have a limited amount of time on this plane. It seems like a scandalous waste of our time and our senses not to use them for good. You have permission to dance, bump your shin on the corner of the bed and fall on the floor in that big romantic moment. Seize the mic at the karaoke night, even though you can't hit those notes even on your best day. You have the right to enjoy birdsong and daffodil or donuts. Anti-matter will not be created if you cultivate the habit of laughing at yourself and the world around you. In fact, as any fan of fantasy fiction can tell you, the most foolproof way to vanquish fear demon is by laughing at it. Turn and laugh at the monster. It's probably you anyway, don't you think? So one of the most powerful silver linings with chronic illness is a clear sense of purpose knowing what really matters because we don't have time or energy to worry about the other things. That has been taken away from us. Friends, acquaintances, well, if they create labyrinths between you and a casual outing, you'll have to just let it go. They'll, they'll fall away. If it's too complicated, you just have to let that go too and concentrate on the friends and family who make it simple because simplicity is the thing here. That's where it's at. I'm guessing you're pretty clear on who and what is authentic by now and supportive and healthy and what or who tends to be exhausting or superfluous. Yet we do need connection. It is imperative that we communicate. It's also non-negotiable. It's human nature to seek deeper connection and love and acceptance. We wanna be seen and heard and understood. We're a fundamentally social species and no more suited to isolation than an ant or a dog or a duck. This becomes increasingly hard because we're increasingly disabled in an ableist world. And no matter what we do, by knowing that we cannot beat Parkinson's, well, let's look at it this way. You're free to play. I suggest you use Parkinson's as an excuse whenever possible. I'm late, Parkinson's. I'm early, Parkinson's. I am happy, Parkinson's. I'm sad, Parkinson's. It's okay. <laughs> Not really, but. Do you see what I'm saying? You've been dealt a hand that's almost impossible. Let's at least make it fun. We can do this. So don't downplay this and say, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Learn how to ask for support. Remain connected in whatever way suits you. We can easily stay connected with all the technology. This is no excuse to self-isolate because self-isolation is death. In fact, it is true that your disease will progress if you find yourself very lonely and disconnected. Find ways to connect. If social media isn't your jam 
and you're not alone. I more than get it. Skip it. If you find it toxic, you know, you're not alone there either. So whatever works for you and stay with it for everyone's sake. That's what you can do for others. So it's been said that managing Parkinson's is a bit like being in a war against ourselves. And we know that wars are not really fought for God or country, but with and for those in the trenches next to us. As much as I detest the language that suggests you either win or lose your battle with Parkinson's, it's an apt metaphor for the camaraderie we feel within the international community. When you see people at your support group, does your heart not grow a little bit warmer? Do you not feel like everything's going to be a little bit more okay because you're seen and heard and you felt this basic human need satisfied? It gets taken away from us with the isolation of chronic disease. Recently, I had the great pleasure of interviewing an incredible spirit by the name of Linda Olson. She's a triple amputee who's diagnosed with Parkinson's. Just after the horrifying accident who, that took three of her limbs, she was laying in a hospital bed in Germany and then again in the States. And when her husband of two years entered the room, she said, it's okay if you wanna leave, I understand. He looked at her like she was bonkers and he said, Honey, I didn't marry you for your legs or your appendages. I'm creating a backpack. Let's do this together. I love you. After enjoying the butt races that Linda developed to keep her cardiovascular system strong, all my excuses about not working out and moving got erased immediately. I suggest you do the same. I've provided a link at the end of the talk for Linda Olson's work. She's also a comp an accomplished professor in radiology, a mother, a citizen, a community member, a friend, a great sister. Whatever it is that you need to get moving, your excuses have now been removed. Get moving if you can, even if it's just wiggling your little toe to start. In the midst of thousands or even millions persevering against incredible odds in the world, living well as though there's a mountain at our gate is so important. There will always be a mountain pressing down on us like the film A Mountain at My Gate that I did with Anders in Norway. It makes us feel like we don't have enough time. The clock seems to be louder and faster and even melting a little bit like Salvador Dali's. It's not. Time is another construct. It's easy for me to say as I sit here in my comfortable home, but I think you know what I'm saying. We don't have the time to worry about everybody and everything and get everywhere exactly perfectly on time with every hair in place. It just doesn't work for us and that's okay, come as you are. You don't deserve to live the way of depression and anxiety and apathy. You deserve to live the fullest and greatest life and the lie that depression, and apathy and anxiety tell us is that we can't do it. Another of my great inspirations has been Nadine Champion. She's a fighter who has had well, she's been beat up pretty badly several times. She survived cancer. She found martial arts and she finally realized something after thinking she was so tough. And here's where it gets into what we call ourselves because it doesn't matter what we call ourselves. It is how we respond to our circumstances that matters. When her eyes were almost gouged out in a bar fight by a couple, she sought out a martial arts expert and she decided that she would learn how to challenge her mind. And she found the answer was change your thinking and to not believe all your thoughts. She reminds us there's no place to hide when everything's against you. There's no place to go, you know? I'm gonna go with awe and curiosity and wonder, as in I wonder what's going to happen next because we don't have the answer. So we don't know how this story ends. We don't know what we're capable of until we're challenged. So when I think of Nadine and Linda, and of course, Wells and Roberto Benini, I think of people who are courageous beyond words I'm awestruck, in fact, by Linda, and you'll, you'll surely hear more of her. So don't forget to take up the space that you, that you deserve in this life. Don't forget to ask for love. You deserve love, full-on love. Please don't misunderstand me, though. I'm not saying be positive no matter what. We know that Socrates had an extreme aversion to nonsense. So I'm inviting you to channel your inner Socrates here with all those memes that float your way about being happy. Avoid negativity, avoid negative people, raise your vibration. Just join in everybody, clap, you know, surround yourself with positive people. Don't listen to anyone who isn't farting clouds of fair trade chocolate. T 
toxic positivity is actually a problem, a huge problem. It's a shaming device if you think about it. I'm here to bring you something a little more actionable than just say pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. Because if you have Parkinson's, chances are you can't reach your bootstraps in the first place, at least not always. So maybe there are no bootstraps, maybe you're barefoot. And sometimes we're crawling and shuffling and shaking and imbalanced. Sometimes I'm Tim Conway playing the old man on the Carol Burnett show with a slow fall down the stairs. And sometimes I'm jazz hands and a little manic. These are medication ups and downs. This is why I'm going to be getting DBS very soon. Well, if you're crawling and imbalanced, you can at least get out of the house as much as possible or get yourself moving, get yourself moving out of the house. Both of those things are good. When you think that you can't do it, ask, who do you think you are? If you can't button your pants anymore, you are a person who might need to have, um, well, elastic waistbands. I'm really fighting this. I've humiliated myself more than once. In fact, I humiliated myself by not having a, an elastic waistband on a date. I couldn't get my jeans off in time. That was fun. So I didn't get a second date and that's okay. I'm not giving up just yet, but what adaptations can we make? What out of necessity in your lifestyle has been changed because of Parkinson's taking your abilities. As we become increasingly disabled, we do need to think about this. Still not ready yet. But these things don't define our quality of life. They're just maintenance, you know, you're still cool. The renowned advocate Kevin Kwok likes to say that his final act of defiance is wearing button fly jeans and shoes with a lot of ties and zippers and clasps because this thinking keeps him young. He likes to challenge himself. <laughs> As long as you're not on a date, Kevin, that's good. That's why I keep singing karaoke, not because I'm a singer or because I sound so awesome, but it gives me a great deal of pleasure, especially when my kids wince at my old school hip hop or what I see as the theme song to Parkinson's. It's by Nathaniel Rateliff in the Night Sweats. It's called SOB. Maybe you've heard of it. I'll leave out most of it because some of the words you might not like, but the hook goes like this. My hands were shaking, my heart was aching, there's bugs crawling all over me. And if you happen to be shaking, use it as the vibration. It's the dance, it's the pressure, it'll get you moving. Use it as an exercise. The hook, my hands were shaking, my heart was breaking, there's bugs crawling all over me. Well, that way if you are shaking, the heart rate will rise and it's part of the act. Karaoke, why karaoke? Because there's no pressure, because it trains our voice we will lose our voices eventually, at least so we've been told, most of us will. So train your voice, keep using it. Sing in the shower, sing everywhere you can. It's not about hitting the notes perfectly. This is not a performative act per se. It's about exercising your vocal cords, your expressions, your enunciation. As an added bonus, you can join in with the community and it keeps you dialed in. I'll leave you with a few slides at the end or a few links rather on a slide so that you can see you know, some other inspiration. So here you are for that. There are just a few things you can do to maintain under circumstances you didn't choose and wouldn't wish upon anyone. Least of all that person to your left or your right. Perhaps they're your support person, your care partner, your family member, your good friend, whoever they are. Well, think about the kind of support they've given you. Thank them. Stay in gratitude. Right now, take a moment, just thank them, whether they're with you or not at this moment. Think about how much support got you here. Think about the generations of blood, sweat, and tears that got you here. You matter. You're here to take up space. Ask your friends and family and support people how they're doing. Keep that gratitude rolling forward. So when I recommend to count your blessings, I mean every single day. That's an answer, too. There's an actionable item for you. I was just speaking with my friend in Uganda. He describes a situation in his town whereby patients are treated as they have leprosy. They are separated from the group and that separation is isolation. And we already know what happens in isolation. We want change. We want the world to know that Parkinson's is not just one picture. It's not a monolith. It's not the stooped shaky figure that you used to find when you Googled Parkinson's. We are diverse, we are connected, we're vibrant. We're a community of people from all over the world with different kinds of Parkinson's. If you've met one person with Parkinson's, you've met one person with Parkinson's. And we are most powerful when we are in our vulnerability. 
I can't wait for the Q&A. This is my favorite part, the collaborative. It is so strange to be staring into a screen instead of seeing your faces. We do interact with each other in a way that is absolutely lovely and I appreciate you being here. Thank you to the APDA for having me today and I look forward to these questions. So get them ready, let's go. How's it going today? It's a good day to have deep brain stimulation, which is what I just got through in the last less than 48 hours ago. I had my second deep brain stimulation surgery. And so I'm a little banged up, but none the worse for wear. And the idea is that we just show up. We're brave and we show up. So how's everybody doing? Okay. I have a couple of uh, questions here that I'll get started on right away. Um, I'm really glad to be here. So honored to be with the APDA today. The first question was, tell us about the community for Kathleen Kiddo and how we can get involved. I've taken a hiatus from social media lately because it really helps me to stay focused when I'm not staring into more screens. So I don't really have much of a community online right now. I do have a YouTube and a couple of other things like my website, which is KathleenKiddo.com, which I'll be updating soon. And I have Medium, which I write on, and some other options. And I will be publishing a book very soon. So you will have other times when you can do that, um, when you can check in with me. Um, what is one thought or phrase that you fell back on to motivate you on the bad days? Oh, this one's really easy. I hear a little voice that says, get up. Just get up, keep moving. And I know that I'm going to be okay because there's so much love in my life and there's so much love around and that's available to everyone all the time. So never give up on feeling like you're alone. You're not alone. I know that it feels that way sometimes when you're in a lot of pain or when you're feeling discouraged, but just stay with that feeling of love, this infinite stream of love that's available to all. Um, Let's see, biggest challenge that I've overcome. Hmm, I'm gonna go with ego. Um, it was very hard for me to ask for help, very humbling um, to continually ask for help from people and to allow that help and to allow, and I mean physical help especially. And the ego fights because the ego wants to be in charge of everything. So I think breaking that down through meditation and prayer and humility has been immensely helpful in my adaptations to Parkinson's disease, which um, that's really the answer for me. That's really my answer um, to be able to adapt and to, and to have improvisation because everything is adaptation. So, um, oh, the, the inspiration links chart, someone asked about that. I'm happy to provide that with, for you. And I can put that on my website as well, KathleenKiddo.com. And we can put it up here with the APDA as well, somewhere so that you can just get all the links. I have a couple of extra links that I left out too that I'd like to add. So, but you'll find um, Linda Olson to be an incredible inspiration. She's really amazing. She also spoke at the World Park since Congress. Big fan, she's one of my biggest heroes. Mm. Oh, getting away from social media. Um, it was making my journey more difficult when I was on social media, actually, because there was a lot of static that I was paying attention to instead of focusing more on the things that I could control. And it, it caused me to do a lot of comparisons and storylining, which, as you know, with agonists and with a lot of the medications we're on, can start to make people feel a little paranoid or a little bit left out. For example, I had a very uh, good friend question me about why I took her out of my Facebook, why I blocked her. She told me I could talk about this, so I am, but she was very upset with me. She actually thought that I blocked her from my Facebook for some reason, and that just gives you an example of how we can sort of storyline on social media, because without the, you know, the, the nuances of language and meeting each other in person, it's very hard to remember that not all our thoughts are real and that our storylines aren't usually aren't usually spot on that way. So it really helped me to be off the media, at least for a while. I might go back on someday. 
Um, let's see. Knowing you brings me joy. I'm in awe of your courage. You teach me to dig a little deeper each day. Thank you. I I really appreciate that. I'm deep thoughts by Heather. Yeah, you know, like that Jack Handy. Deep thoughts by Jack Handy. Um, no, but, no, but thank you. I'm learning so much. I think because I'm so open and awestruck and curious that I just keep staying open. Um, thank you for that. What do I do in my hard days to find joy? Oh boy. I look outside, I look at my daughter who's right here with me. I look at the trees and I, I practice gratitude. I literally sit in my room meditating and I say, what's working today? Like I was in so much pain after this second surgery and I thought, what is working really well today? Wow, you know, I can breathe really well. I have running water. I have a beautiful yard that I can go out and garden in soon when I can move again. I'm lucky to be able to get DBS surgery. Um, I'm just feeling grateful really helps. And also besides the practice of gratitude, this radical acceptance, which is a lot harder to do than it sounds. So um, someone asked, let's see, how do, how do I feel right now after the second surgery? I feel a little bit um, woozy today because I'm a little, it's not been 48 hours yet, but I'm, really grateful that I do have a little bit of Tylenol and a little bit of painkillers available and that my meds are kind of hitting, which is nice. Joy to the world when the meds hit, you know, it's like jazz hands were on and then when they're off, you know what that's like. So this hopefully makes the off times a little less. My journey to get diagnosed. Oh boy. That took quite a while. Um, I didn't have the best uh, diagnostician at first. When I finally got a diagnostician that I could work with, he was extremely thorough, thankfully, but um, he didn't really have the best bedside manner either. And he put me on a lot of medications I didn't need to be on. Now my doctors are great. They are so spot on. They have a chart that I can check in on. Um, interacting with your doctor is so important. Uh, really stay in touch and be honest about everything that you can. But the journey, oh my gosh. <laughs> I think the worst part was not knowing what was wrong. Not having a diagnosis is much worse than having one, as you probably know. Um, has there ever been a time when you felt like your diagnosis was a gift rather than a life sentence? Yes. Thank you for asking, Anise. I feel like I like myself better with Parkinson's. And I know that sounds strange because pain changes people in ways that can be difficult. But I think the humility alone and allowing me to see the bigger picture and see that everyone's suffering, and it's not just me, it took me out of myself more and got me away from that sort of egoic place of feeling like what's happening to me and my pain It became more universal. I can see the bigger picture now. That is certainly a gift. And I can go anywhere in the world and have a place to stay and a friend. Um, Cat Hill came to help me recover she is by trade a nurse, and it just so happens that she had the patience to deal with me. So there's a friend from the Parkinson's world, in the Parkinson's community, who came in to help me recover from a major surgery. That is, you can't, I mean, I'm getting a little emotional because you just can't thank that person enough. It's really amazing. Mm, changes in surgery. Yes, I'm, um, so far, my balance is a little bit different. I'm a little shakier. I didn't used to have so much shakiness, but I don't want to speak too soon because, you know, I'm not programmed yet. I don't get programmed till like the middle of the month. So I'm going to hold off on responding too much about the surgery. Um, biggest benefit of DBS. Hard to tell. Like I said, I haven't been programmed yet, but I'm really excited to talk more about that. I'm happy to do some videos or whatever anybody needs. Um, I am so grateful to have this opportunity for DBS. And I know that I chose the right surgeon and the right doctors and feel very confident about this helping with the off times. The off times were getting so bad. The efficacy of my drugs had failed so much. that I just didn't have any time when I could even catch my breath. So now it just feels a lot better. Um, I also want to add that I think um, we all have each other. That's right. The challenge is realizing when to ask for help. It is not easy to ask for help, but we, you know, people can't read our minds. You know, we need to know that we need to express ourselves as clearly as possible. 
and to thank our caregivers and the people that are around us because they're taking the hit. They're doing everything. Mm. I really appreciate the people in my life. Um, and I can't tell you enough how much it meant to me to have so much family love around me. My brother flew in from out of town to surprise me, my mom, my partner was here. There's so much going on. I participated in studies. Yes, I'm in a sleep study right now, actually, that has to do with DBS. And I am thrilled to be in that study because sleep has been a big problem. And I was also talking with some people at Stanford about doing a sleep study there. Um, I also wanted to add a few more things. Um, I feel like the APDA is doing some really killer work. And I can't believe the programs that are offered take advantage of these programs. Every workout, every Every um, there's someone that's going to be giving tips and tricks soon. Take advantage of all of this. Uh, go to Davis Finney's website and check them out. The World Parkinson's Congress. There are so many options, but the APDA has an excellent um, roster for you to choose from. So really use use everything that you can, and don't forget to dance, even if that just means moving around in your chair. What guidance would you give care partners about caring for loved ones with PD? Wow, you are so patient. First of all, thank you for your patience. When you're caring for us, it's not easy. Um, I think that we need to ask you how you're doing more often. How are you doing, Jennifer? You know, I think it's hard to be patient with someone who's so frustrated not being able to do things and doesn't always express that in a way that's easy for us to hear. And um, some days you don't exercise. Let's see, what is your favorite? Oh, dance. Love to box. Boxing is such a joy for me. Um, for sure. So dancing, boxing, hiking. Um, I love to do some workouts with my daughter. Sometimes we'll just do some light weights. Um, I love to do pull-ups and the basics like pull-ups, sit-ups, and so on and so forth. Um, There's so many different exercise programs, so I highly recommend getting involved with um, PD Active and all the other options that you have. My family isn't really getting the help we need. So what can we do? Okay. This is from a Parkinson's patient who's saying that their family is not really understanding what kind of help they need. Um, it is really hard to communicate Parkinson's. It is one of those things that is, it's a challenge because sometimes you're on and sometimes you're off. What I would say to your family is very clearly, I really need your help. I would not ask if I didn't need it. Here are the specific ways that you can help me. Make a chart if you need to write some things down as they come up and try not to do it in the middle of a large emotional outburst or a large emotion, because then you won't be as good at communicating. And believe me, this comes from trial and error. I wasn't always good at this. Many times I have, you know, snapped at someone or said something wrong and, and I've, I've definitely injured some of my relationships. So this comes from trial and error. Like I said, just keep trying to be patient with yourself. Compassion, self-compassion is so important. Um, Non-motor symptoms have shown up for me. Oh, anxiety, depression, are you kidding me? I'm crippled sometimes by anxiety, both causal and conditional. Uh, I'm sorry, both causal and chemical. Okay, so I'm, that can be really tough. Uh, the anxiety is, is, is my biggest um, non-motor symptom. Um, what is the most encouraging and meaningful support one can, one PD can receive from friends? Okay. Um, just having someone say, I'm here, I'm listening. Um, to have somebody say to you that I hear you, even if I can't understand what you're going through, is so huge for us. And also allow us some time to get from point A to point B. Sometimes we're not very quick. And give us like sort of a wide berth, if you will. You know what I mean? Like just have a little patience with us. That really would mean a lot. Um, so that support can come in so many different ways. Okay, that looks like that was the last question. I would love to take more questions, but I think we're out of time. I really appreciate you coming today for the APDA Midwest Conference, and we're so happy to have you here. It's been a joy.
At Synovian, patients are at the center of everything we do. Inspired by patients every day, we work to advance cutting edge science and medicine to help improve healthcare worldwide. At Synovian, we are passionate to discover and develop innovative therapies that can transform the lives of patients with serious medical conditions. This is what motivates us to look beyond the science and get to know patients as people. Collaboration drives our research and fuels our work with advocates like you. We are committed to working together across all backgrounds, ethnicities, identities, and lived experiences every day. And together, we can lead the way to a better tomorrow. I'm Jen Merger, and I'm a fitness instructor with the APDA St. Louis chapter. You have all most likely been sitting for a bit, so I would love to take the next few minutes to get your bodies moving. I'm going to stay seated as we warm these bodies up, but if you would prefer to stand and you have a safe space to move around in, by all means, be my guest. If you're seated, let's move to the edge of our seat. We're going to warm these bodies up from our head to our toes. Let's start with some neck moves. We're just gonna take it and move from side to side. Two, three, four, and five. Great work, meet me in the center. Let's go down and up. One, two, three, keep it slow, four, and five. Great work. 10 shoulder rolls back. Let's go. One, two, make them big. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Rotate those wrists. One, two, three, four and five, switch directions. One, two, three, four, and five. Step tall and reach to the side. Let's go. One, big reach. Two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Moving down that body. Let's go ahead and reach for each other through that screen as we push and pull. Two, pull. Three, pull. Four, pull. Five, reach big. Pull five more. Six, pull. Seven, pull. Eight, extend those arms. Two more. Nine, pull. Ten, and pull. Let's sit up nice and tall. Bring those knees up for ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine and ten. Extend those legs out. One, two, get them nice and straight. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Gonna wake up those hips. Let's go ahead and step out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight, nine, and ten. Last minute here. Let's put all those body parts together and march it out right here. Start to wake up that heart muscle a little bit as we put those legs and arms together and just finish these little moves with a march in place. Give me about 30 more seconds here. Sitting up nice and tall right here. Pull those shoulders back. We are moving. Bring those knees up just a little bit higher. Stick with me for about 10 more seconds. In fact, let's count it down. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. Great work. It feels good to move, doesn't it? Speaking of moving, come check out our YouTube workout. I, along with a handful of other instructors, lead you through some workout, YouTube workouts every week. So go to the APDA St. Louis chapter website for more information. We would love to have you join us. Enjoy the rest of your day and keep moving. I look forward to seeing you soon. Welcome. I'm Joel Perlmutter. I'm delighted to be here. I want to thank APDA for sponsoring this in the Congress, especially Kathy Crane in St. Louis and Leslie, of course, in the whole entire national office. It's really a pleasure to be here.
I always like to start with my financial disclosures, and these are the sources of support for our research. It's primarily the National Institutes of Health, which is your tax dollars and my tax dollars at work for something really good, as well as the APDA, which has sponsored us in a major way and really permitted us to do many of the studies I'm going to talk about today, and especially the Greater St. Louis chapter. You notice I have no relationships with any companies, so I have a total free reign. Here's what I'm going to talk about today. I first want to give you a little bit of an update on COVID effects on research. It'll be short, but it'll be very important. Then I want to talk about some of our research about the causes of cognitive problems that occur in people with Parkinson's. And then I'm going to go through a few potential new treatments and give you the skinny on those. So first, let me just catch you up on COVID. So as we all know, we faced this pandemic for now near, for more than a year, just a bit more. It really stopped our lab work, but only temporarily. It halted face-to-face -face clinical studies temporarily. They've restarted now. But it gave us an opportunity to focus on enhanced time to do data analysis for data that we had already collected. It increased our ability to write manuscripts for publication and share our findings with other people in the world and actually gave us time to write grants. So we were highly productive. I would say we really did not lose a beat. In fact, it gave us a chance to catch up in many ways. And now, as we're starting to break through and beginning of the end and people are getting vaccinated, and I'll just say this right up front, get your vaccine. Everybody with Parkinson's should get the vaccine. If they have a particular question, they should talk to their doctor, but we all need to be vaccinated. Even if you've had COVID, you should get vaccinated. And the best vaccine is the one you can get. Don't worry about one kind versus another. But what we're doing now, as far as research, is now data analysis is going forward, lab work is ramping up, and clinical research is now going forward. So we're able to bring in research participants and do research, although we tend to bring in only those people who have relatively low risk from COVID, even though the chance of having any exposure in our hands is extremely small, probably much higher going to the grocery store, definitely. Uh, we wouldn't bring somebody in if they have uh, diabetes and asthma, for example. So we're moving forward and it's time to get going. So let me show you some work. So let me remind you, Parkinson's disease, we all know about the motor problems, the tremor, the slowness, the stiffness, the difficulty with maintaining balance. But there are two other key components that are very important that cause just as much difficulty for a lot of people. And that's the psychiatric problems that may occur, like apathy, which is a lack of motivation, just sitting around, not really interested in doing things, anxiety, which seeing things that aren't there or hearing voices or more importantly being suspicious of people that's what we call hallucinations or delusions and those are serious problems that can come along with parkinson's and be exacerbated by some of the medicines in addition there can be cognitive problems and so these are thinking problems that have to do with specific kinds of thinking so executive function really refers to doing things in sequential order or knowing where things are as visual spatial function, all of these types of things can lead to dementia, the kind of thing you see in Alzheimer's. But the dementia of Parkinson's is really somewhat different. In Alzheimer's, it's more memory problems initially and foremost. In Parkinson's, it really has to do with these other functions, although memory dysfunction can be a part of it. I'm going to talk a lot about these things. I'm going to talk about the cognitive problems and what causes them. So let's go through that first. So one of the major things we've been doing and was originally supported by the APDA is we have a very large longitudinal study, long-term study in people with Parkinson's disease. And we take these people and we put them, we do cognitive testing, thinking tests, we do motor testing, how well they can move, we do scans with an MRI scanner. We do scans with a PET scanner. We do spinal taps to measure their spinal fluid. And we continue to follow these people every three years. 
And we follow them, in fact, until they no longer need their brain. And then we study that brain as well, and we make biochemical measures. So I'm going to tell you some of the results of this big study. And we call it the PIB study uh, for protonopathy and Parkinson's disease. And a major part of this study is really run and organized by Dr. Megan Campbell, whose picture you see here. And one of the very cool observations that she's made, and that's what I'm showing you here, is that we can divide up people with Parkinson's into three groups. Those that have primarily just movement problem, those who have mostly movement, but also some psychiatric problems, and those who have primarily movement and mostly cognitive or thinking problems. And those three different groups can be really, we can take people and categorize them that way. And that's what's shown over here. So here's the group of psychiatric and motor. Here's the group of motor only and motor and psychiatric. Now, exactly how we do this statistically is not really the point, but the key feature is they really are separable. And more importantly, is this approach for doing this kind of division of people into these three different categories can identify nearly 98 or 99 percent of people with Parkinson's. There are other ways, tremor predominant or mostly just stiffness, but those methods only can div uh, divide people up or account for maybe two-thirds of the people at most. So it leaves a lot unknown. So this was an important method uh, for determining uh, how to categorize people with Parkinson's. Who cares? What does it matter? Let me show you. Here's one reason it matters. And that is if people are motor only or psychiatric problems in motor, they go a longer time. And this is now going longer time, higher on the graph is longer without developing dementia or thinking problems. Whereas the people who have early thinking problems and motor and thinking cognitive problems, those people get demented much earlier. So these are good, these class, this classification system is a good way to predict to some degree, to a reasonable degree, the onset of dementia. Further, it also predicts lifespan to some degree. Those who have mostly just motor, tend to live longer. Here, staying up on the graph means people are living longer. Whereas those with either the psychiatric and motor or the cognitive and motor tend to not live as long. So it's an important distinction. Now the question is, how come? What's going on in the brain that makes these people different? Let's explore that. So what's going on in the brain in people who have dementia, or difficulty with their thinking. So now I'm gonna bring you back a number of years when we first began this study. And this is the basis for it. So we know in Parkinson's disease, this is a picture of the brain from the side view. And if you cut the brain uh, down the middle and look at it from the side, this would be toward the front, the back of the head, and the back of the brain, the lower part of the brain we call the brain stem. There is in people with Parkinson's, deposit in the brain of an abnormal protein in clumps, and that protein is called alpha-synuclein. And we see that in brain tissue. After somebody dies, we can actually look at the brain tissue, and that's what we're seeing in these brown clumps. When we see the clumps in, in residual nerve cells that are still alive, we call them Lewy bodies. That's why we call this condition sometimes Lewy body dementia, because we think it has to do with Lewy bodies. And so when this alpha-synuclein, which typically starts in the lower part of the brain or this very uh, midline part of the brain here, lower part in the front, starts there, then it works its way up. When it gets up to the upper part of the brain stem, that's when people develop movement problems with Parkinson's. But if it spreads higher in the brain, we think that causes thinking problems. So when I first started this study, we wanted to determine what caused thinking problems in people with Parkinson's. And at the time I used to teach that about half the time it was caused by coexisting Alzheimer's disease, not Parkinson's. 
And in Alzheimer's disease, there are two abnormal proteins in the brain, at least. And these are the two major ones. One's called A-beta amyloid. That's shown here. And another is called tau. And when I wanted to do this study, I wanted to take people with Parkinson's and follow them for a period of time. And I wanted to determine who was going to have or who had thinking problems, either one of those, based upon either Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. Well, at that time, there was a new PET scan that was just developed, and it was able to measure the A-beta in the brain without taking the brain out, right? So we could put somebody in a PET scanner and measure their amount of A-beta. And the idea was, if we saw a beta in the brain, that would indicate they had Parkinson's as the cause, as opposed to, I mean, Alzheimer's as the cause, as opposed to Parkinson's. Well, let's see how that turned out, because I'll tell you right off, I was wrong. Instead, well, here's what we found. When we do scans, and this is a scan, a PET scan, through the brain. Now, this is a cross-section through the brain. This is the top, the front of the brain the back of the brain, like where the left ear is and the right ear. So it's a cross section through the brain. And warm colors means there's more of this A beta amyloid. And we measure that with a, a PET measure called PIB. And so this would be a positive scan that tells you there's this abnormal A beta. And this would be a negative scan. Now, it turned out both of these people had Parkinson's disease and had thinking problems. And the idea is maybe this is the one that would have coexisting Alzheimer's as causing their thinking problems. And when we did this kind of study, we found people that had Parkinson's with normal thinking, with just mild thinking problems, more severe thinking problems. They had an increasing risk of having a positive PIB scan. And uh, by the way, age match controls, some of them had positive PIB, PIB scans. And those are people who usually go on to develop Alzheimer's. But that's not exactly the case here. When we took the brain out, it was really surprising. What we found is these people had abnormal A beta, but they also had abnormal alpha synuclein throughout the brain. In fact, almost everybody had alpha synuclein throughout the brain. And about a third of the people who already had dementia and Parkinson's also had this A beta or positive PIB. But hardly any of them had abnormal tau. And so it was not just coexisting Alzheimer's disease. Rather, it was Parkinson's disease with alpha synuclein throughout the brain, causing their dementia probably, as well as some people had A beta. We'll come back to that in a second. So what about these people with the abnormal A beta? And this is now an image. This is a cross section through the center of the brain, looking at it from the side. This is the front. This is the back of the brain. Here's that brain stem. This is the part of the brain. When alpha synuclein gets to it, you cause movement problems. What I'm showing you here is where the differences are between people with Parkinson's compared to those healthy controls that are the same age. So this is what's different between Parkinson's and people without Parkinson's. And what it's showing is there's a lot of this A beta amyloid toward the front of the brain and a bit in the back. So the question was, remember I told you that uh, maybe 26, 25, 30% of these people have abnormal scans. So if we actually look at all the individuals and plot them out here, and now this is from like 300 people, and we just look at the uh, amount of A beta. Here's people in blue with Parkinson's. A lot of them are abnormal, but it's really only about a third or so that are abnormal. The rest are down here, the same as the healthy controls without Parkinson's. So it's only about a third of these abnormal ones that are accounting for what we see if we average across everybody. So again, what I'm telling you is that the A beta contributes to Parkinson's, but it's in a, not most people, it's just in about a third in that case. So what happens over time? And this is now new. So by the way, don't write this down and publish it because we haven't published it yet. We're about to send this paper off shortly. 
What we did is instead of just looking at everybody with Parkinson's and seeing how this changes over time, what we did is we divided it up into people that had low amount of A-beta from the beginning versus those that had high amount of A-beta. And then we watched what happens over an average of about five years difference. And here's the controls without Parkinson's and here's what the changes. So this is comparing the last scan to the first scan. So what happens over the course of five years and how much change there is per year. We actually calculated it that way. And so there's not much change in somebody that's a control without Parkinson's. And you know what? There's not all that much change in people who start off low. They don't seem to get a lot more, except maybe in this one little area. We'll come back to that. But the people that start high continue to get higher. So they continue to grow. And remember, those are the, well, so what does that mean? Well, it turns out that that scan is measuring the A beta, the A beta amyloid. There are other ways we can try to measure it. We can look at people who have spinal fluid uh, that indicates high A beta in the brain. And this is a little bit upside down for you for just a moment. And that is people who have low levels of A beta in the spinal fluid turn out to have higher levels in the brain. So low levels are abnormal in the spinal fluid. And so everybody who has A beta high A beta is in pink or red here versus those are in green. And they're just different ways of determining that. And that's either by measuring in the spinal fluid, by measuring one of the PET scans. So this would be a PIB negative, uh, a, a PET scan that was negative. And then the other way of determining that is genetically, there's a particular uh, genetic marker we call o APOE4 that makes people at higher risk for Alzheimer's, but it turns out it makes people at higher risk for having a beta with Parkinson's. And so we see whatever that high risk factor is in green, it makes their predicts decrease in thinking, whether it's executive function, visual spatial, or even memory, which is not as big a deal as executive function and visual function. So all of these things are going down. So A beta is predicting higher A beta means more likely to have cognitive decline. And this measure going up is more decline. And this sum of boxes is a measure of thinking total in, in all these different kinds of areas. So this is very important. So what you need to do is figure out how come this is causing or related to this problem. And it turns out that we look at the brain after people no longer need it, so when they die. And when we first published this a number of years ago, which was the key data that uh, enabled us to get this grant, and again, that key data was obtained with support from the APDA, I just want you to know. And we found, again, in that study, that of the first 33 people that died, that everybody had abnormal alpha-synuclein in their brain, and about almost 60% had alpha-synuclein and A-beta, but not tau. And only one in that group had alpha-synuclein, A-beta, and tau, which meant they had Parkinson's and coexisting Alzheimer's. But most, even though all these people had thinking problems, did not have coexisting Alzheimer's disease. And most importantly, does it matter, as I, I told you before, those people with the A beta, which are in red here versus normal, not A beta, the people with A beta tended to die sooner. So their disease was more aggressive. Whether you start it from the onset of Parkinson's or the onset of the dementia, people tended to die sooner if they have abnormal A beta in their brain. So not only does the A beta predict onset of thinking problems, but it also predicts shorter survival. So let me tell you another story because that's not the whole story. And I'll tell you the story about a brain I just looked at last week. This was another person who was severely uh, demented, a lot of thinking problems along with their Parkinson's. And in their brain, they had, a, they had hardly any alpha-synuclein 
in the higher parts of the brain, and they didn't have any A-beta. Well, what the heck's causing that thinking problem? So here's the other measures we're making. In addition, most people know in Parkinson's disease, there's a deficiency of a chemical messenger called dopamine. That's what we give L-dopa for to replace that. That helps the movement. But it turns out from our measures in the brain, if we look at different parts of the brain here and measure another chemical measure, uh, messenger called norepinephrine or serotonin, norepinephrine is wiped out in selected areas of the brain as well. And here we're seeing it way down. And so these reductions in the chemical messengers may be another reason that there can be thinking problems aside from alpha-synuclein deposition or even A-beta, but maybe these transmitters alone can contribute. And this gives us potentially new targets for treatment. And now we're just putting together the data from the last uh, 33 people we've examined their brains and made these measurements on it. We're about to send that publication off. All right. That's our research in a nutshell, some of it. Now I'm gonna to talk to you about a few new potential treatments. And uh, some of which I think have a lot of potential and some of which I'm not so sure. And I'll tell you what I think. So first of all, people know about this. This is how we do deep brain stimulation. We put somebody we, uh, in the, uh, in the operating room, we put a frame on their head, we do an MRI scan of their brain, and we put a wire deep down into the brain. And I'm gonna show you what it looks like going deep down into the brain. Here it is, going down, down, down. And what we're targeting is this little guy down here that you're seeing from the side. That's the subthalamic nucleus, an area deep in the brain where we put a wire and we shoot in electricity and we can make dramatic benefits. That's a Kind of an old story with, with a lot of research still going on about that. All right. So we do that by putting wires, making a hole in the skull and putting a wire deep down in the brain. So now there is a new approach to that, uh, which is not entirely a new thing, but was just you know, had some recent publicity. And that's called focused ultrasound. And the idea behind focused ultrasound is instead of putting a wire into the brain, and giving electricity in there with stimulation, or even putting a wire down and making a hole in that part of the brain, because that can give some benefit too, they can take ultrasound waves from outside the skull, focus them in this particular area, and with the ultrasound, focus it so intensely that they can actually make a hole in this part of the brain. Now, some people call that non-invasive. And the reason they say non-invasive is they're not making a hole in the skull and putting a wire. But my perspective is if you're making a hole in the brain, that's invasive, but it doesn't require making a hole in the skull, but you're still making a hole in the brain. So they, and they identify their target using an MRI scanner. So this is kind of cool. So there was a study published recently in the New England Journal of Medicine about this. And here's what it showed. They did this procedure in a group of people with Parkinson's and they did it in, and they uh, did a fake procedure in a group of people with Parkinson's and the active treatment group was 27. The sham or fake treatment was just 13. So it's a relatively small study. And here are some of the issues. They did this only on one side of the brain, not on both sides. So when we do deep brain stimulation, we almost always do both sides of the brain because most people have both sides of the body affected. And if they have just one side of affected, affected initially, then they almost always develop symptoms on the other side. But in this particular study of focused ultrasound, they chose to study, they chose to treat only one side. And the reason for that is if you make a hole in both sides of the brain, you have a very high risk of speaking problems and a number of side effects that were not wanted, okay? So there's a major limitation right there in who this could be applied to with current methods. But what it did do is it reduced their Parkinsonism on the other, on the other side of the body for the people that they made the hole in. And that's what's being shown here. 
And it did this and they followed it for two, four, and even 12 months, although they only reported the data out to six months, out to, at four months rather than the 12 month data. Now, you don't need to read anything here, but the point is this is listing the side effects. And what they had is uh, not many, but some people had balance and walking problems out a year later. And a few people had involuntary twitchy movements we call as dyskinesias, because now we've got one side of the brain uh, treated and the other side's not treated. But when you take medicine by mouth, which they all still need to do, you're still giving both sides of the brain the same amount of medicine. So you can get excessive treatment of one side when you're trying to give an adequate treatment for the other side. So it's a little screwy. Uh, and that can cause some difficulties with treatment. So there are some challenges to this. And the other point is, when we do deep brain stimulation, if you get side effects, you can adjust the stimulation to minimize those side effects. And if you don't have enough benefit, you can increase the stimulation to improve it. When you make a hole in the brain, you can't make it smaller. You can only make it larger. So it's less forgiving by far. So there are limited applications here. And this, there was a editorial in the New England Journal written by Dr. Moisa Ushe, who runs our DBS program with me, and talking about the concerns about this procedure. First of all, it's only done unilaterally, one side of the brain, not both. It cannot be uh, adjusted with the whole size, as I talked about. And you may get prolonged side effects. So these are issues that hopefully down the road could be improved with better targeting but that remains to be determined. Okay, next thing I wanna talk about. So these are short snippets. This is a very important biochemistry slide. I want you all to memorize this, but if you don't, that's okay too. What I'm talking about here is in the brain, there's deficiency of dopamine. And so we treat Parkinson's by giving, not dopamine, because that won't cross into the brain. This is the periphery, the rest of the body, swallowed by mouth, it gets in the blood, and you give the precursor of dopamine, and that's L-dopa or levodopa. And levodopa crosses into the brain and gets converted to dopamine. And it gets converted by this little guy. And this little guy is an enzyme that converts L-dopa to dopamine. And when you lose brain cells, that cause Parkinson's, the nerve cells, they're the ones that have this uh, enzyme in it called uh, decarboxylase, if you will. So one approach, one new approach, is instead of just giving L-DOPA, let's put directly into the brain genes, DNA, that codes for that enzyme, and let's replace the missing enzyme. And that's what the, Chris Bankowitz and his team did at UCSF. And they've done some amazing studies. And this is a MRI scan through the brain. Here's the front of the head, one side of the ear, the other side of the ear over here. And this is the part of the brain where there's the deficiency of dopamine. This is called the putamen. And what they've done here is they put down a little tube in the back here where you see the greatest loss of dopamine and into a place just in front of that, two spots on either side, and infused some genetic material in a virus, a virus that doesn't cause any symptoms, but it's a way of carrying it into the brain. And that can then transmit its DNA uh, material so that the brain can make more of this enzyme and produce more dopamine. And what they're showing here is they were able to show the extent of the infusion by labeling the infusate, the, the fluid that they put in. And they did this in three different groups, small groups, just five in each group, and with different doses of this DNA. So they have three different doses and small groups, and they're following them but not scientifically controlled. It means they know what they're getting, the people know what they're getting, so there's some potential bias in this. So it's not a perfect study, but it's a great beginning. And here's what they found. In the three different groups, the, after they get there, here's the baseline measure, then this is after the infusion, and this is uh, after infusion, then they see that there are lower scores, which means better response uh, to L-DOPA 
and these people that have the enzyme now that converts dopa to dopamine. So they are improved to each dose of dopa that they get. And this is showing that across in all three cohorts. And furthermore, they did a PET scan that actually can measure the conversion of dopa to dopamine. And here's the baseline scan. And then four years later, they show an increase. So red means more. So here was less back here, less back here, which is a typical type of scan you see with Parkinson's. And now after this infusion, it's increased. And here's the quantified numbers in the three cohorts, kind of a dose response. You give more, you get more. And this is just showing their overall improvement in each cohort. Here's baseline. The blue means time off when they're not getting any benefit. And with time, they actually get more benefit or less time when they're off, when their medicine's not working at all. And the same is true on all three cohorts. And finally, this is just looking at their scores on medicine, as well as they still get benefit off medicine altogether. So this is an interesting potential treatment down the road. There's a lot of work that needs to go on, but this is a genetic-based approach to replace the missing enzymes in the brain. Another one slide on this one, and this is a study looking again, focusing on alpha-synuclein. Remember I told you that it starts in the lower part of the brain mostly and then spreads. Well, this is trying to stop the spread. And this alpha-synuclein starts at like a little clumps and then gets, it starts aggregating and then gets into these big fibrils. And what they're doing here is they're taking antibodies. This is the kind of thing that way you fight COVID, for example, that's the basis of a vaccine, essentially, where now the vaccines are mRNA-based, so it codes for uh, a protein that the body will then make antibodies against the specific proteins on the spikes of the COVID virus. Now we're making antibodies against alpha-synuclein fibrils. And so that's way cool, because if you can knock these down, maybe you can knock the spread down. And if alpha-synuclein is responsible for a lot of the clinical manifestations of PD, then this has potential. So where are we on that? This is a study looking at small study. Again, they looked at controls, 48 people and 18 people with PD. The first step in this kind of study is to make sure it's safe. And that's what they did here. They tried two different doses of this antibody. And here are the two different doses that are used. And then they looked at how well the alpha-synuclein was incorporated. And they see that this is based upon your dose. Here's the two different doses. And this was well tolerated. So we know that this approach is well tolerated. We don't know if it helps anybody feel better yet, but that's the next, that's, those studies are ongoing right now. All right, now I'm gonna to turn to the last topic and that's this little fella. So if you don't know what this is, that means you haven't been in St. Louis. This is in the botanical gardens. This is called the Climatron. And this particular sculpture or this particular building, the architect was a guy named Buckminster Fuller. And Laura Dugan, clever as she is, was a, a, a geriatrician actually at WashU and now she's at Vanderbilt, took this molecule that has 60 carbon atoms in it and is cleverly named Buckminster Fullerene because it looks like a geodesic dome, which the Climatron is. And she added on these other little uh, components called carboxy groups. And this turns out to be the most potent free radical scavenger and has some other anti-inflammatory actions in the brain. So we did this big study together where we gave animals a drug that, and I put it right in, this is now the brain, the skull, back of the skull, front of the skull. It's not exactly a person, is it? And I infused into the blood vessel that goes to the brain, this drug called MPTP that destroys the dopamine producing nerve cells. And when I've done this for many years for different studies, we always see after about three or four weeks that animals become Parkinsonian on the other side of the body, and then they remain Parkinsonian for years. Well, we took half these animals and we treated them 
with either this new drug that we call carboxyfullerene or a fake drug. The animals didn't know what they got. I don't know what I gave them because Lara Dugan would load these pumps that we infused them with in Vanderbilt and send them to us or send us pumps filled with food coloring. I can tell you, we published this several years ago and I still don't know what animal got treated what way. And that kept us scientifically controlled and blinded. But what we found when we took all the data, packaged it up, sent it to Lara Dugan, she knew the code, divided it into two groups, sent it to another statistician who didn't know what was, what was group A and group B. Here's what we found. The animals that were treated with the real drug, this is now showing they clinically improved. Their Parkinson's got better, whereas the other animals continued to have Parkinson's. So after we started it, here's we gave the toxin that caused the Parkinsonism, uh, the death of nerve cells that continues for a few weeks. Then 10 days later, we started this new drug in half of the people and uh, half the animals. And the animals all continue to get worse until about three weeks. And then the animals treated with the carboxyfullerene improved. Wow. I'd never seen that. And no matter how we measure it, we can use PET scans. We, here's the baseline measures on the two different groups. And here's after treatment. So this is before the MPTP. And here's after MPTP. The animals that had the placebo had a great reduction, loss of those nerve cells. The animals that got treated the carboxyfullerene, not normal but way better. And the same with another pet measure and their Parkinsonism. Now here, high is bad, low is good, was much better. And the dopamine we actually measured in the brain because we took the brain out was very low in the animals that got the uh, carboxy, that got placebo and much higher in those that were treated. So this is kind of exciting. So we should move forward. And a company wanted to go forward and take this into uh, clinical trials. And I said, no. And the reason I said no is described in a paper that Jay Mighty here and I wrote recently about another Parkinson's trial to see if we could slow disease progression, which I participated in for 30 years. Another one failed. And the, one of the reasons I think that some of them fail is they do not have good measures of the drug's effect directly in the brain we need to measure target engagement. And so that's what we're doing right now. And we're using this brand new PET CT scanner for our animal studies that you don't care about this. I care about this part. This is a phantom showing how good this scanner is. And what I'm telling you here is we can see little dots that are just 1.2 millimeters apart. That's tiny. Our current scanners we'll use in humans are, you can measure stuff that maybe four or five millimeters apart. This is amazing. So this is gonna really help us move forward. And we're now developing different tracers that'll permit us to measure the effects of this carboxyfullerene. And at the same time, we're preparing for a human trial. So that's how we're going forward. And this is the study that we're doing to demonstrate that. We're doing ratings of people, PET scans, we give them the drug, then we'll give them either the carboxyfullerene or placebo, do our PETs and see if the PET measures measure what we think it is. So that's to come. These are the people who do all the work. I just sit around and talk about it. And I really appreciate everybody's attention. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you very much for listening uh, to that lecture. I believe I'm live right now. We have our first question that's come in, and this is a question from Ori Morris-Witt, and she asks, what about gene therapy? When do you think this will be available for uh, people uh, with Parkinson's disease? And so that's a huge question. And so let me tell you about that. So gene therapy refers to multiple different kinds of gene therapy. One that I've discussed already is delivering a gene that can help replace the missing one of the missing enzymes called decarboxylase. And that may be moving forward, at least in larger clinical trials over the next four or five years. Traditionally, we also think of gene therapy as ways of interfering with the progression of disease specifically. 
And that's useful or has potential to be useful for people who have a genetic form of Parkinson's disease that's caused by a specific gene mutation. If we can identify that specific mutation and then give a therapy that directly interferes with that abnormal gene from functioning, then we potentially have a gene therapy approach. There's a couple of challenges with Parkinson's disease. First of all, most people with Parkinson's disease do not have an identifiable gene abnormality causing their problems. So for those people, that kind of targeted gene therapy will not be helpful. For the rare people that in fact have it, then we still need to identify mechanisms of delivering this, what's the target exactly, how we can do it. So I think it's going to, that type of therapy is going to be many, many uh, years off at this point, at least five to 10 years off for that kind of therapy to be widespread, if it is. Next question, here's one um, from Luetta W. And are there studies showing how red light or infrared therapy can help with Parkinson's? light therapy. Well, actually, there's a study right now not looking at red light, but white light, and they're using a light therapy to test whether that can help improve uh, sleep and subsequently uh, to regulate sleep cycles and also to determine whether that can help people's uh, symptoms of Parkinson's across the board. So there's potential there down the road. I'm not aware of any specific red light or infrared therapy at this time. And Karen Frank asks, why has there been a return to lesional therapy recently? It seems that they abandoned that approach in favor of DBS years ago. What has changed? Good question, Karen. So that was kind of my point. I'm agreeing with you, but there are some advantages if lesion therapy uh, is effective. And one advantage is it's really one and done. You don't have to have battery changes. You don't have to have the complicated programming. And particularly in parts of the world where they don't have access to all of this high technology, perhaps those people could get just a simple lesion made in their brain, and that would help them for the rest of their lives. So that's kind of the, the lure of doing that. The big downside, of course, is once you make a hole in the brain, you can't make it smaller. You can only make it larger. So if you have side effects from it, that may be with the person forever. So that is a downside. And I believe this is going to be a very limited approach down the road. So I'm agreeing with you in large part, Karen. And then Justin uh, asks a question, how close are we to a disease modifying treatment being available? Well, every day we're closer but we still have a way to go. And I think what is closer really at this time is that we have now several different types of approaches being done. So one approach I talked about, which is in my lab, a drug that may interfere with the mechanisms in the brain that cause damage to nerve cells. That could be a huge advantage. And in fact, the medication we have can be taken by mouth if it proves to be effective in people. All right, so that's one thing. Another approach is to try to knock down alpha-synuclein, and that's another part that I talked about. And so if we can give antibodies or any other number of ways of reducing the spread or accumulation of, of alpha-synuclein in the brain, that potentially could help reduce the symptoms or prevent progression or slow the progression of Parkinson's disease for many people. But the other caveat there is we're not really 100% sure that that's the only mechanism for reason people get manifestations of Parkinson's. It's the, it's the mechanism doer. It's the popular one today, and there's increasing data about it. But remember, I also mentioned a person who had marked severe Parkinson's, severe dementia, thinking problems, and yet didn't have much alpha-synuclein in higher parts of the brain, just had it in those lower parts of the brain. So there may be other things going on. So this is uh, a bit tricky. All right, Jennifer Johnson asks, what are the long-term results from focused ultrasound? Well, the study 
that was published, which is very just in December of 2020, so that's the most recent one, the long-term results they published were four months, not very long. They gave some data from 12 months out. So there's really no long-term data. And there are some concerns about that. So when making holes in the brain other ways, some of those people who had relatively small holes to try to limit side effects with some benefit, that was great, but the benefits waned or diminished over the course of several years. So we don't really know how long these benefits will last. We also don't know how long side effects may last. So it is a challenge. Next, doing great, Joel, thank you. Take your time with these questions. We've got 11 more minutes. I wasn't, probably wasn't supposed to read that. All right, what is most effective treatment for Parkinson's tremor? Anything new? Ah, tremor goes back a long way. And uh, the reason I'm saying that is probably 35 to 40 years ago, there was some thinking that a select group of medications called anticholinergics were selectively good for reducing tremor in people with Parkinson's disease. As opposed to L-DOPA, they thought this drug was better. And the data for that well, there wasn't really any very good data. It was mostly some experts with their experience thinking that. The problem is, in that particular case, is that although even if people with uh, have even if people had benefit from anticholinergics, anticholinergics really are fraught with many, many more side effects than just L-DOPA. So, a drug, even if it were to be more effective for tremor, we have to be careful it doesn't more uh, effectively cause additional side effects. So that's a risk. Then the other part about tremor response is some people with Parkinson's, when we give them a levodopa, the tremor goes away. And other people, we give levodopa and most of their motor symptoms improve, but their tremor may not respond at all. And we usually use tremor response or dopa response, I'm sorry, dopa response as one of our better predictors in response to subsequent deep brain stimulation. Well, tremor's an exception to that. People may not respond to dopa, but may have a great response to uh, deep brain stimulation. So getting down to the point. Do we have medications or therapies that are selectively beneficial for tremor compared to the other uh, manifestations? And I would say really at this point, we don't have any good rational basis for developing those. We don't really understand what causes tremor versus the other manifestations of Parkinson's. And so we don't have drugs that selectively target tremor in a reasonable way. All right. How, next question, uh, let me just back up and see if I missed one. So Melissa Scrivan asks, how do I know when I'm ready for DBS? How do I know that DBS is even right for me? You, okay, so DBS, so there's some controversy about this one too. There are some Parkinsonologists that say, get your DBS here, let's do it early because we can give you benefit for a long period of time. Uh, and I'm the kind of person who said, if tablets work that you can take by mouth, don't make two holes in your head. And that's really the way I approach it. So if medication works and it's doing the job, then you do not need DBS. If you have problems with medication and you and your doctor, especially your doctor is certain that, or has the best indicator that you actually have regular Parkinson's disease and not one of the lookalikes because the others don't respond to deep brain stimulation. And you don't have any contraindications or manifestations that would suggest that you would be at higher risk for side effects. For example, severe thinking problems don't get better with DBS. In fact, they may get worse. So those would be a stopper. So again, if medicines work and you've had a uh, good adjustment of medicines and still do not have adequate benefit. And that usually means medicine effect 
effects has a good strong effect, but it lasts a short time. And trying to increase the dose gives you a lot of dyskinesias, the involuntary twitching movements, and that's limiting you. Or drops in blood pressure related to more medication is limiting your treatment. Then DBS may be a very reasonable option. All right. And Susan Holthouse asks, how can one join a trial for carboxyfullerene? How can you join a trial? That's very easy. I think a donation of about $10 million would do it. And what do I mean by that? I mean, right now, uh, the research we're doing is in animals and we're simultaneously getting ready to implement trials in humans. But remember, carboxyfullerene has never been given to a human yet. So the first trials are really in just healthy volunteers without Parkinson's to ensure that it's tolerated well. So we start with low doses and we look for tolerability and safety. So that's usually takes a couple of years. Once that's done, then we can start. And if that's successful, then we can start giving it to people with Parkinson's. And that initial trial, which is usually called a phase two trial, is usually done with a relatively small group of people and we give varying doses to see how somebody with Parkinson's tolerates it, make sure it's safe. It's usually not a big enough trial to determine whether it helps, but rather determine what's a safe dose to give and uh, in people with Parkinson's. And then if that works out okay, then we do the larger phase three trial, which is now testing it in lots of people with Parkinson's disease and determining uh, does it in fact slow disease progression because that's really the goal. So it's going to be several years, but if you wanna send us your name, we'll put you on a list. How's that? All right, and another question is, is the presence of Lewy bodies at postmortem essential to confirm the diagnosis of Parkinson's or can it occur without them? Right on target is that question. So in general, the criteria, first of all, a diagnosis of Parkinson's is certain only when we look at the brain after somebody dies. So in life, the best Parkinson specialists can be 100% accurate of the clinical diagnosis. That's only because they don't check brains. In other words, nobody really is. For those of us who check brains, the best we can do is about 90% accurate. And what we use to determine that somebody had Parkinson's is in the brain, we see loss of nerve cells that produce dopamine. And in the residual cells, we see clumps of alpha-synuclein. And those clumps that are in the cytoplasm of those cells are called Lewy bodies. And so Lewy bodies at postmortem are essential to confirm the diagnosis of Parkinson's with one exception. And here's the exception. There are a few types of regular Parkinson's disease. So notice Parkinson's disease, not just one disorder, it's actually several different ones, but there is a form that's caused by a rare genetic abnormality. And that particular kind has loss of the nerve cells, but may not have Lewy bodies. So that's a very rare cause. And so if we suspect that in, in a brain, we can actually take some of the tissue and, and perform DNA analysis. But in general, the bottom line is almost everybody requires uh, Lewy bodies to confirm that diagnosis. Audrey Southard has a question. So is it a good idea to measure my A beta as a way to have a potential cognitive or know your potential cognitive decline? That's an easy answer. Absolutely not. There's, this is right now for research. We do not know this ability to predict on an individual person's benefit. There are many people that can still progress, uh, that do, everybody progresses whether they have A-beta or not. In general, it looks like those with high amounts of A-beta may progress faster, but that does not mean we're uh, able to predict on an individual basis. That's uh, remains to be determined. It might be useful to do that down the road if we had a treatment that was specific for that A-beta problem and if treating the A-beta problem helps. And we're not even sure that's true. In fact, it's likely not even true for Alzheimer's where A-beta is a major player. 
And there have been plenty of studies showing that clearing a beta from the brain does not make people with uh, Alzheimer's better. So how could that be? And the reason for that is a beta may be a marker of what else is going on in the brain. And even that's true in Parkinson's. It may be a marker of more severe brain disorder, but a beta itself may not be the bad player. So there's a lot to be learned and a lot more research to be done. Marina the Gatesworth wants to know, in your opinion, on Aricept in relationship to Lewy body disease. I do have an opinion about that. Aricept and drugs like that have been shown to have modest, very modest benefit in people with Alzheimer's disease. The data for people with Parkinson's is very poor. And I personally rarely ever uh, prescribe it. There's some, now, that's my individual bias. There's some, even in my group, who believe that giving these kinds of drugs can help to some degree for people with thinking problems who also have developed hallucinations. I think the data for that is marginal, of course. I do stuff where we don't have good data yet, too, because there's just not enough data to help us in treating all the problems that we run into. But in general, the one thing that is clear when we prescribe those medicines is uh, some companies making money. But how much it really helps the individual person remains to be determined, especially in Parkinson's disease. Dave May asks, anything new for freezing of gait? Oh, I could have shown you some stuff on that. Actually, there are several different groups working on freezing of gait, including right here, Gammon Earhart and uh, Pietro Mazzoni, who's uh, in our group, and I just love saying his name, Pietro Mazzoni. It's a brilliant motor physiologist, Parkinson specialist in our group. And they're looking right now, they're doing studies uh, using automatic detection of sensors placed in shoes, for example, that can determine when a freeze is about to occur. Just for those who don't know, freezing refers most commonly to a sudden cessation of movement or a difficulty initiating movement, particularly of the feet. So when somebody gets up, it's hard to get started. It feels like the feet are glued to the ground or when turning the feet get stuck. And this problem can lead to falling and be a major issue. And so these sensors that they're working on can detect it. And then once they detect it, they could deliver a little buzz to the foot and that could break a freeze and help people move. And so there are a number of strategies along those lines that other people are doing in New York at Columbia and here at Washington University. And those kinds of uh, what I call mechanical or physiological type measures, not drug therapy specifically, uh, may have a major advantage for people with freezing. And that's particularly important because some people believe that freezing doesn't necessarily improve with deep brain stimulation. And in general, that's an observation from a lot of people, although we have several examples of people with major freezing that did extremely well. Justin uh, asked a question, the FDA approved the Blue Rock Phase 1 Safety and Tolerability Study of MSK DA01 Cell Therapy. Do you believe this may help as a stopgap for more motor PD uh, patients? Uh, I think that we really don't know. This is way, way too soon uh, for us to know much about that. So uh, the FDA does have to approve uh, drug studies uh, for those drugs that are um, not approved for the indication for which they're being tested, which is almost always the case. All the, and there's clinicaltrials.gov, a website in which you can see all ongoing or most ongoing clinical trials. I would caution you that just being listed on that website does not mean the FDA has reviewed them or approved them or anything like that. They're just listed by the sponsors and the people implementing those studies, because if they don't do that, they can't publish the results. In any event, lots of good questions. I really wanna thank once again, the APDA, the American Parkinson's Association and the Greater St. Louis Chapter and the Midwest Congress organizers for all that they've done to make this program possible. I think it's incredibly important and we appreciate the support at Washington University of our Advanced uh, Research Center. Over the years, we were able to make a number of advances, including the ones I talked about today. 
Thank you very much for listening and your attention and for your questions. Delta Dental Missouri's mission is to improve oral health in our communities. So what does that really mean? Improving oral health takes a variety of different um, approaches. One is to provide care uh, to the 1.9 million members that we serve in Missouri and across the country. Uh, but beyond that, there are hundreds of thousands of people that don't have the, you know, the funds or the access to dental care. So we provide donations, dollars, and volunteers uh, to a variety of different uh, organizations that help support our mission. The, the power of a smile is, is, is huge. Part of what we do is we help people take care of their teeth so they can have that you know, smile that they can be proud of.
there. This is Johanna Hartwine, a family nurse practitioner at Washington University School of Medicine. Welcome to PD Midwest Congress 2021. Uh, interesting way of giving a presentation that we're all doing today. Uh, as you can probably see behind me, I'm in my own house talking to you, hoping that you're all safe uh, from the COVID virus and hoping that most of you are vaccinated by now. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about myself to start. Uh, so as I said, I'm at WashU and I work at the Movement Disorder Center at Washington University School of Medicine Barnes. Uh, I have been with the Movement Disorder Center now for, it will be 22 years in November. So I was just a, a young little wee lass when I started and uh, I've been running around with these doctors since then, primarily taking care of Parkinson's patients. Uh, I had a grandpa who had Parkinson's disease and trouble with his thinking and memory as well. And I lived with him for 10 years and I have MS. So sometimes in our waiting room, I'm the patient out there waiting to see the doctor. Uh, I always say that I hope that that gives me a good heart for people who are going through similar experiences. Uh, today, we're going to talk about how should you talk to your healthcare team about your Parkinson's. So there are several factors that can make um, Parkinson's a challenge. You are all more aware of those even than what I am. You're the ones living with it every day. But there are things that are challenging from a healthcare perspective point of view and things that are challenging from a patient point of view. And I thought we'd talk about a few of those. So first of all, it's difficult because it's learning to navigate a whole new world. So you were never told you were gonna get Parkinson's. There was no study guide. There was no Parkinson's for Dummies book when you first got diagnosed. You know, it's a ton of new information that's all coming at you very quickly. Uh, you know, you go from, oh boy, maybe I just have a tremor uh, to somebody telling you you have Parkinson's and that's very, very overwhelming. Uh, and it's a ton of new education. So probably the first few years that we diagnose Parkinson's and then see you in the office, we're trying to spend a lot of time on educating you. Um, so that you understand why we're trying to help you with the decision making that we're trying to help you with, and so that you feel like you have more power over the disease itself. Another thing that could be very confusing is all the new words. So never in anyone's life have they heard these words like dyskinesia and dystonia and orthostatic hypotension. Um, you know, the words themselves can be scary and they can be new. And sometimes we as doctors and healthcare professionals, forget that you don't know what all these words mean. Um, we've been saying these same words for 20 years. So the names are very familiar to us and sometimes we forget that they're not so familiar to you. Uh, another issue is that the symptoms of Parkinson's can be very overwhelming from time to time. You know, So that makes it challenging when you are talking to your physician or to your nurse practitioner and you wanna talk about, they say, what's bothering you most? Well, there may be 15 things that are bothering you quite a bit, and all of those need to be covered. Uh, the progression of the disease itself can be very scary, and the unknown can be very scary. So I'll have patients ask me, what is going to happen to me in 15 years from now? And, you know, that's a difficult thing to try to predict because everybody with Parkinson's is a little bit different. Um, there are no two people that progress exactly the same. There are no two people that respond to medicine exactly the same. There are no two people who have the same exact symptoms. About the best thing we can tell people is that your past progression is the best predictor of your future progression. So it's kind of like the stock market. Past performance predicts future performance. But there's always caveats there. Um, but I know that people always ask me the question of, you know, how long is it going to be till I'm in a wheelchair? And that's not anything that we can really predict. It's very difficult to know. And really some of those things, even the knowledge of it, when there's not much you can do about it, that's scary. So I know a lot of people with Parkinson's um, spend time laying in bed at night thinking what's going to happen to me down the road. And that can be challenging. Um, the other thing is that Parkinson's affects way more than just walking. You know, it's not just the motor symptoms of the disease. Certainly we see those. We see tremor, shaking in the hands in a lot of people. We see imbalance, freezing up of your feet when you're walking, uh, stiffness, trouble with dexterity. So we see these motor symptoms, but sometimes the bigger issues are not the motor symptoms. Sometimes the bigger issues are the non-motor symptoms. Things like trouble with your swallowing, uh, loss of appetite, constipation, bladder issues, trouble with sleep, 
um, trouble with mood and spirits and depression, trouble with hallucinations, um, you know, trouble with thinking and memory. Those sometimes create bigger issues in the motor issues, and, and that can make PD a challenge, and it gives us a lot to talk about at every visit. Um, another thing that's challenging is, you know, we as doctors sometimes ask, so tell me what your day's like in Parkinson's. And people will start laughing and they'll say, well, you know, no two days are ever exactly the same for people with Parkinson's. Uh, I've even had some people who had a great day on Wednesday. So they think, okay, on Thursday, I'm going to do the exact same thing that I did on Wednesday. I'm going to get up at the same time. I'm going to eat the same foods. I'm going to exercise at the same time. And still nothing that they did made a change. Um, in what they did for the day, but their symptoms weren't exactly the same or even close to the same from one day to the next. So that can make it difficult when we say, how are you doing overall? It's hard to say that whenever no two days are alike. Um, you know, another problem, and I'm very guilty of this myself, is that we healthcare providers sometimes talk in science speak. So we may start talking about the basal ganglia and, uh, you know, different treatments or different huge medical words, you know, just the word carbidopa levodopa is a pretty big word for most people to try to swallow um, and try to remember. And we're talking about all kinds of various drugs, all kinds of various treatments. You know, we say things like DBS, and we forget that people with Parkinson's don't all know that DBS means deep brain stimulation. So sometimes it's really a problem on our end where we're not talking at the right level to what the patient's knowledge is at that particular time. Another thing that's always a challenge is that visits are only two to four times a year, you know, and that's kind of if you're lucky. Some patients are only seen once a year, and that can be a big challenge because by the time that you make it in, you know, you've been waiting for this appointment for months and months, and you get in there, and there's only 30 minutes to talk, and you know you're not going to be seen again uh, for another six months, that can be very overwhelming. How am I going to cover all these things I want to cover at just one visit? And then sometimes our expectations, our goals, and the things that we think are the most important issues as physicians and healthcare providers are not the same as what our patients and our families think are the main issue. So for instance, I had a lady who was having some trouble with her walking and she was having limping in one of her legs. And uh, I spent almost the entire visit assessing this leg. Is it a thinking in my mind, boy, this is a big deal. She might need a surgery. Is it coming from her back? Um, is the problem coming from her hip? Could she have a neuropathy that's causing her to lose sensation? You know, and we did all these things and all these, you know, questions and all this assessment. And at the end, I said, okay, I think you need an MRI of your spine. And she told me, I'm not getting an MRI of my spine. Uh, there's no way I get a back surgery, even if I needed one. Um, what's important to me is that I've been really constipated. So I had spent this whole visit working on what I thought was important to both of us, but really it wasn't important to her. It was only important to me. So understanding our patient's needs is something that we always need to work on as well. And that you need to clearly let us know, like, this isn't what we need to focus on. This isn't a big deal to us. This instead is what's a big deal to us. Okay. So first of all, um, how do you go about finding a healthcare provider for your Parkinson's? So you know, obviously I'm biased in this regard because I work at a movement disorder specialist um, place. I work at um, a Parkinson Center of Excellence, but there are fairly good studies that show that people who are seen by movement disorder specialists um, tend to live longer and do better for longer periods of time than people who are seen by a general neurologist. Certainly a general neurologist beats a primary care doctor. Um, other ways to find a decent doctor. Word them off from your friends. Obviously, if somebody's had a bad experience with a certain group or certain doctors, you know, you may not be as interested as going there. You'll find information from support groups about who they feel like has been a good doctor. Um, and sometimes it depends on your definition of a good doctor. Some people would define a good doctor as somebody who spends a lot of time with me and who listens the most to my needs. Some people would define good doctor as you know, oh, they may be a little nerdy, a little bookish, but I know that they're the best. They're involved in all kinds of research. They're on the cutting edge of medicine. Um, you know, they seem to know the answers to the questions that I ask. So part of it is also patient preference and what you're looking for. Um, I would say no matter who you see, make sure you find a healthcare professional. And that's what HCP means, um, a healthcare professional who has lots of experience with Parkinson's. 
Um, this is one of the times that you don't want to hear, oh, you're the first Parkinson's patient I've ever taken care of. And the APDA is also a great resource for local neurologists in the St. Louis area. And even beyond that, they can probably help with those sorts of issues in terms of finding a doctor. The big caveat here is, you know, when you are seen at a movement disorder center, be prepared to wait. Um, a lot of our doctors, it could take six months to a year to get in. So I always tell people who call me or get a hold of my email some way or the other who aren't patients and they'd like to become one, you know, that you have to be patient and realize it's going to take a while and that you may need to see a local neurologist in the interim. So some of our doctor or some of our patients will see local neurologists while they're waiting for the appointment to see us because they don't feel like they could go six to 12 months. And in most cases, that's probably a good idea. Uh, things that you want to make sure that you have in your relationship with your primary care physician and your neurologists. You know, you want to find somebody who does listen to you. So, you know, if you're coming in and complaining about the same problem time and time and time again, and it's never addressed, then that's an issue. Um, but you also have to be aware that uh, there are some things that we can't necessarily fix. Um, so, you know, in terms of let's say dementia, you know, we really can't fix dementia, unfortunately. So we are there to listen to you, but there are some things that really can't be fixed. You want to be sure that your healthcare provider uh, gets back to you within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, so what's a reasonable amount of time? Probably 24 to 48 hours. Uh, you want to be sure that if you ask a question that you get an answer. And there's, you should never be afraid of finding a second opinion. And, you know, lots of my patients have confided in me because they feel like it needs to be a confidence. By the way, we went and had this doctor look and I just wanted to tell you, we still like you and it's nothing you did wrong. We're not at all offended if you find a second opinion. Um, you know, I think that if people feel like they need a second opinion or feel like they may get along with a different doctor or nurse practitioner or physician's assistant better, then it's perfectly fine to seek that out. And in many cases, because sometimes you can only see your movement disorder doctor once a year, we have lots of patients who see a local neurologist and then see us once a year. And we just tell them, you know, if the local neurologist makes medication changes, let us know so we can make sure that we're all on the same page and that we have your medications updated. Uh, but I will also say watch for too many irons in the fire. And what do I mean by that? Uh, what I mean by that is sometimes the primary care doctor, the local neurologist, uh, the urgent care center where somebody stopped off at and us is all trying to make changes to an antidepressant or um, to even the Parkinson's meds or to medicines to manage like people who have orthostatic hypotension where their blood pressure drops really low and when they stand up they feel lightheaded. Um, there can be lots of people all coming in at once trying to make changes there and that doesn't benefit you as a patient to have all these changes and suggestions coming in at once. So it's just important that one hand knows what the other hand is doing as you move along. So these are just the various ways that you can talk to your healthcare team. Um, email. So um, nowadays, email is primarily done through patient portals. So Barnes has a patient portal. Mercy has a patient portal. Um, I think, you know, all of MOBAP, I mean, all of them have patient portals. Um, so you should familiarize yourself with that. Um, generally speaking, we don't just do regular old email anymore. And the reason for that is, is um, it can be a breach of confidentiality, of your confidentiality. And from our end, sometimes we then forget to copy an email into your patient chart. So if I tell you on email, not on the patient portal, but just regular email, okay, let's increase your carbidopa levodopa by half a tablet per dose, and I forget to put that in your chart, then the next person who goes in your chart says, well, what do you mean you're taking two and a half? I show you're only taking two. And it can be a problem with documenting and with that knowing one hand, knowing what the other one's doing. Um, so email, phone, in-person visits, and now in this era of COVID, Zoom visits are becoming much more common as well. And we'll talk about each. So I find that email or the patient portal is really the best way to reach a member of your healthcare team. Um, and I understand some people are not internet savvy, and that's okay. You know, for those patients, it's always fine to call in and use a phone. For patients who are internet savvy, um, the portal is probably the best way to reach somebody between visits, and it's the best way to check in before things turn into an emergency. 
So, you know, what I mean by that is, um, you know, we've had patients who have shown up at their emergency room who have said like, well, you know, I started feeling weak on one side of my body about a week ago um, and I didn't think anything really of it and it just got a little worse over time and now today I can't move my entire side. Well, what if it was a stroke? Um, in this case, the case that I'm talking about, it ended up being a terrible urinary tract infection and the person was admitted with that. But had we reached out you know, at the first sign that something was wrong, we could have run those tests before they ended up in the emergency department. So if you can, you should be sure that you're enrolled in your healthcare team's patient portal and that you know how to use it. They're generally fairly easy. And if you need somebody to walk you through it, all the hospitals have specialists for that. Uh, be directing your questions and explanations on your email. So we don't need to know like, hey, I just wanted to call you to let you know that my constipation is sometimes a problem, but not really. Um, I got up two times last night to pee, uh, and I've been falling. Okay, so are we trying to talk about the falling? Are we, is the constipation a problem? Is getting up two times to pee at night, is that an issue for you, or is that just your norm? Focus on what you want to talk about. Um, you know, keep it direct. Uh, then be sure to be check back and see if the healthcare team has answered you. You should get in your regular email something that says you have a new note in the patient portal. So that should alert you. But, um, you know, sometimes I'd email patients back and then eventually they've called in and said, well, I didn't get, ever get a message from you. And I'd say, okay, well, let's go in and check it. And they go in and check it and sure enough, it's there. So just make sure you check back. And then, you know, if it's been 24 hours, um, make sure that you send another email because if it's been 24 hours and you haven't heard back, then I hate to say it, but your email could have been shuffled in Lord knows where, whenever our group specifically, I know gets around 200 emails a day. So some of them are going to get lost, misplaced, not seen. If you haven't heard back in 24 hours, check back in. Um, also, be sure that if we ask you, if we respond to you and ask you a follow-up question, make sure when you reply back to us that you answer that follow-up question. Uh, with phone, in our office, the doctors or nurses will never call you back. Uh, or I'm sorry, the doctors or nurse practitioners will never call you back. But the nurses handle our, our calls, and that's the way it is in most offices. Um, you know, you call, you talk to the nurses, they get back with us um, as the nurse practitioner or doctor in charge of your care, and we let them know what to do. We're pretty lucky here because our nurses have, have all been here for 10 to 20 years. So sometimes they kind of know what you need to do without even checking in with us, and they may tell you what to do. But they always check in with us at least afterwards so that we're aware of what's happened. If there were an issue with what they'd recommended, we would have them call you back and try something else. Uh, you might also consider writing down questions ahead of time if there's a lot of issues to cover with a phone call. Um, you know, because again, sometimes with Parkinson's, there are multiple issues. And lots of times we'll call people back and address the issue. And then they call back the next day and say, oh, I forgot about this. Um, so it's, sometimes it's better to keep a note handy of, okay, these are the things I wanted to talk about. Uh, be sure we have the correct phone number for you, that it's a working number and that you have the phone nearby. Um, you know, just today, I know that one of the nurses said, I tried calling this patient six times and it has went to voicemail each time. Um, so we'll continue to keep trying you for a few days, but if after a few days passes, we generally just presume, okay, another doctor probably handled it or they'll call back again if they need it. Um, and then lastly, again, if it's been 24 hours, call us back and let us know. So for in-person or Zoom visits, the biggest challenge here is for all of us to remember, at most, we have 30 minutes to cover the visit. Um, um, we wish that we had more, but then our visits would be, instead of only being able to see us every six months, they'd be more like once a year for everybody. Uh, and also, really, this is kind of what insurance um, covers in terms of timing. So really, we have about 30 minutes to cover the visit. You want to come with a list of questions or issues, but I would not come with 15 pages of detailed notes about how every day has been. Um, there's in a 30 minute time period, there's just not going to be enough time for us to be able to read through that, come up with ideas and also answer all of your questions. Um, so I always suggest that people kind of write down what are the three biggest issues that I want to discuss. Um, and that way they're kind of at the forefront of your mind um, whenever you come into the visit. Like these are the real three things that I need answers to. Um, so come with a list of questions or issues, but I, if you have 200 questions, they're not going to get answered. Um, if you have 100 questions, you're not going to get answered. You know, you can always email those questions. It's, it's not a good use of your in-person time with the doctor or the nurse practitioner to come in with that many questions. You can email those if you do need help with those. So, 
So come in with three big issues and three big questions maybe, okay? I always tell people to consider bringing a separate set of ears and a second set of eyes. I have lots of patients where, you know, the patient, I say, do you have any depression? And the patient says, no, my mood and spirits are good. And their wife's sitting next to him going, who's that guy? His mood and spirits are not good. Or the wife is telling me, no, I'm not having any falls. And the husband's saying, honey, you just had three falls in the last month. What are you talking about? Um, so sometimes people may recognize things about us, our family members, that we don't recognize. Or we may not recall things quite as accurately as what we'd like. So it's always have some a good idea to have somebody there that can either endorse what you're saying is true and correct or can tell us what their version of the story is. Um, I would also say to make the most, the best use of your time by answering questions succinctly. Um, so for instance, I asked somebody the other day, uh, as I do at each visit, how are your bowels moving? And they went on to tell me about, um, you know, colon cancer that they had and all the chemo and the different radiations and the different surgeries that they'd had. Well, come to find out, you know, here I am typing away and asking all these questions. That was 20 years ago. Okay, so it wasn't the main issue that we needed to address. So again, if something's not a main issue, you don't have to go into your entire history of, well, you know, I did have some bladder problems 10 years ago and I had a few infections 10 years ago. If everything's been fine recently, it's fine to say my bladder's fine right now. Okay, um, if something doesn't make any sense to you, then stop and ask for clarification. Okay, and it's fine. Even if we're talking to you like I'm talking to you now, stop and say, hold on a minute. I'm not quite sure I understood what you meant by that. Um, you know, could, could you go over that again? Or could you explain that in a different way? Or what does this word mean? It's okay to do those things. Uh, we don't want this to be an authoritarian visit where we're telling you this is the way it's going to be. You know, we want to partner with you in your care um, so that we're all on the same page. Um, if necessary, if you're making multiple medication changes that are being made, ask for written instructions. Say, you know, could you type that out or write that out for me? I don't think I'm going to remember all this. Um, my patients know that everybody gets written instructions. Uh, and then if you have something that only happens every now and then, and it's a motor symptom, then bring in a video. So you can do a video on your phone and bring it in so that we can see it. This is especially true with like things like dystonia. If your foot curls in like this sometimes a day, or your toes curl up like this sometimes a day, um, or you're having movements like this or movements like this. And we're not sure, is it tremor or is it dyskinesia? You know, or we're not exactly sure what you mean when you called in and talked to us, bring us a video so that we can review it because that will likely help. And you know, it's just the way that things work that just like when you take the car into the shop and it doesn't make that funny clunking noise once it's at the mechanic, when you bring the patient in and they're suddenly not having that symptom that you wanted us to see. So a video can be very helpful. Um, you want to always try to keep track of when a symptom appears in the levodopa cycle. So when we're always asking about medicine kicking in and medicine wearing off. Um, so for dyskinesia, for example, peak dose dyskinesia, which means about an hour after a dose of medicine, is very common. Sometimes people also get wearing off dyskinesia when they're almost due for a dose of medicine. Trying to keep track of when dyskinesia or tremor or dystonia, that cramping, or cramping up of your neck happens within when you've taken your last dose of levodopa is important. So we wanna know, does it is it more likely being caused by levodopa, being at peak dose, or is the symptom more likely being caused by levodopa wearing off? Because as you can imagine, you would treat the two completely oppositely, or depending upon if it's a peak dose symptom or a wearing off symptom. And also feel free to ask about your UPDRS score, which is Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. That's when we have you doing all this stuff and walking and pulling you backwards and holding your arms up. Um, we do those scores so that we can kind of keep track of disease progression over time. And so we can see if certain therapies like physical therapy or a new medicine are making things better, worse, the same. And also feel free to ask about what stage of Parkinson's disease you have. Uh, and we'll be happy to address that with you as well. So what's generally covered at a, at a visit for Parkinson's disease? So we're always, again, asking about your response to carbidopa, levodopa, or other meds that you're taking. So there are lots of other meds for Parkinson's, but no question carbidopa, levodopa is the gold standard. But so we're always asking, can you feel it kick in? Can you feel it wear off? 
Does it seem to help this symptom, that symptom, another symptom? Does it seem to cause side effects? Um, and that's so that we can try to, try to determine, are you in a good place in terms of the dose that you're on? Or do you seem to need more medicine? Or are you having side effects and maybe we need to give you less medicine? Uh, so when we talk about side effects, we're always talking about nausea, lightheadedness, which is this, a sense that you could faint or pass out when you stand up from a chair, dyskinesia, which is the wiggly Michael J. Fox movements, um, or hallucinations. Those are kind of the big things that we watch for. And again, those are covered with our doctors are covered at kind of every visit. Um, we also ask about what's your balance and walking been like? Have your feet been freezing up? You know, and since I'm not with you in person, I, I can't do my wonderful imitation of freezing of feet, but it's basically when you're walking along with little steps and suddenly your feet start moving very slowly or just moving in place or stuck to the ground. Um, we ask about exercise and phys physical therapy. Um, we ask about your appetite, your chewing and swallowing uh, and constipation. Uh, we'll ask about your bladder because all these things can be affected by Parkinson's. We ask about your sleep. We ask about your mood, your anxiety. Uh, we ask about your thinking and memory. And then we cover the Parkinson's exam, the UPDRS, and sometimes other exams if you have other neurologic things going on. We try to provide education during that visit. We tell you about different research we may have going on, and we answer your questions. So as you can see, all of this has to fit into a 30-minute visit. Um, but sometimes when you know going in, what are they going to ask me about? And you, after you've been doing this a few years, you start to realize like, okay, this isn't normally on the list of things that Johanna asks me. So I need to write down that I also need to ask her about this, this, or this. So this is just kind of a general, um, what most visits would cover. Uh, so kind of rules of thumb to have a productive visit, a productive visit with your doctor. First of all, be honest, no matter what the issue. I always tell my patients, we can talk about sex, drugs, and rock and roll in here. Um, so I talk about inability to maintain an erection with patients. I talk about um, panic attacks. I talk about um, spouses arguing. Um, I talk about thinking and memory problems. I talk about driving issues. I talk about peeing and pooping somebody's pants sometimes. Okay, there's nothing that you can tell us that we haven't heard. And you're in a private room with a doctor or a nurse practitioner or a phys physician assistant. We want to help you with these issues. Okay. Again, if something is confusing to you, ask for clarification. The last thing we want you to do is walk away from us unhappy or feeling like you didn't get anything out of the visit or feeling like you, know, you weren't heard and that your questions weren't answered. Uh, I always say, arm yourself with knowledge. Uh, and it's good to come in and say, okay, I read this article, what do you think? That's fine. But be aware that not all knowledge is equal because it turns out if you want to look, find anything on the internet, you can find it out. And sadly, a lot of different places are peddling snake oil. Um, you know, they're trying to sell you things to make money that are not really going to be helpful to you. Um, and then be honest. Uh, if you're feeling unheard, say that. You know, we want to help you. We, that's our job. That's the whole reason we're bringing you in for a visit is to help you. It's all about you. <laughs> um, but also manage your expectations. And I say that because some people really think that we can give them a certain amount of medicine that will fix their Parkinson's so that it's like they don't have Parkinson's. Unfortunately, that's probably not a reasonable expectation. Um, you know, there are certain things that we can fix and certain things that we can improve and certain things that are just really, really tough to fix. Um, next, we always want you to take advantage of your therapies. So every time that you talk to me, especially, you're going to be bugged about physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, um, you know, support groups, boxing, research. I've never met anybody who did those things who went on to regret that. Um, you know, maybe, maybe a few people would have had physical therapy and ended up injuring something else. But again, that's few and far between. Um, you know, these things benefit you because they're putting you in touch with experts. They're putting you in touch with your peers so that you can share experiences. And in lots of cases, there's exercise involved, which is always a good thing with Parkinson's. And then ask the questions. If you get a new medicine, ask, why am I being started on this medicine? What is the goal here? How is it going to help me? Um, ask, what are the possible side effects of this medicine? Um, you know, if you look at the back of the box of Tylenol, one of the potential side effects is death. Okay? That's very unlikely. 
but we should be able to write down or tell you about the three or four most common side effects that you might experience. You can always feel free to ask, how come we're not using this drug or this drug or this drug? If we're not using it, there's usually a reason why we're not, um, but it's always fine to ask. You can always ask, what is the purpose you said you want this MRI done? Why do you want it done? You want this lab work done? Why do you want that done? Um, if there's a specific issue you're having trouble with, always feel free to ask, could X issue, let's say it's freezing of feet, be better improved or managed? Um, and then you can always ask, what can I expect in the future? And we will be honest with you. You know, some people really want to know the down and the dirty of what might this look like 20 years from now. Some people, when I, when I ask them, you know, do you really want to know what end stage Parkinson's look like? The real answer is no. <laughs> um, so, um, and just remember that not everybody reaches end stage Parkinson's. You know, some people, I've had people had Parkinson's 35, even 40 years for young onset PD. Um, so it's not always this 20 years from diagnosis to death. Uh, and then things to really understand about Parkinson's and its treatment is if there's a major, unless there's a major side effect, we want to give any med change some time to work. So we want to wait one to two weeks to overall know are things better, worse, or the same. Calling us in one day and saying, I don't think this is working is not going to give any of us any information. Unless it's like, okay, now I'm seeing little green men. Okay, that's fine. We need to change that. Uh, also, know that Parkinson's is slowly progressive. But if there's something else going on, like you're sick or you just had a surgery, your symptoms can worsen quickly and you'll probably bounce back. You should always know that antidepressants and anti-anxiety meds and the meds for hallucinations can take four to six weeks to be fully effective. So again, you can't call in a week and say, I don't think this medicine's helping. We're not surprised by that. It's probably not going to take full effect for a few more weeks. Uh, understand that the goal of Parkinson's is to minimize symptoms, not to cure symptoms. Um, and that unfortunately, at this point, we can't fix a disease. Understand that exercise is the only way that we know how to slow down the rate of progression of this disease. Um, you know, I mean, it may not change what's happening in the brain, but it changes your body's reaction to what's happening in the brain. Um, you know, memory and thinking problems, those are almost impossible and very difficult to treat. The same thing that can be said of freezing of feet and imbalance. Um, and those are the two biggest things in Parkinson's I wish I could fix. Uh, just know this, that we're as frustrated as you are that we can't treat some of these particular symptoms. And we're as frustrated as you are that there's no cure or way to slow the progression yet. But also know this, there's a ton of research in the pipeline. Things in animal models, human models, even looking at genetics and cell therapy. So there's a ton of research into trying to get to the bottom of this. Um, and we want to partner with you in doing just that. So I thank you for your time today. Uh, we are going to move towards uh, the live question and answer session, and I will look forward to getting your questions, concerns, input. Uh, all of my patients know I'm a big hugger and a kisser, so I'm going to give hugs and blow kisses. Thank you so much. Hello, hello everyone. I'm live. Woohoo. Um, so thanks so much for being part of uh, my presentation today and for being uh, available for the live Q&A session here. Thanks to the APDA for all they're doing to put this on. Um, first question here from Kathleen Kiddo. Uh, she says, I've had trouble communicating with my primary care doctor. Whoops, sorry. Uh, and their staff regarding the details of Parkinson's. It's almost as if med schools skip how to care for neurology patients, especially young onset PD. Uh, I wish I could say that I was surprised by that, um, but uh, unless you're in neurology, you probably didn't see many patients uh, with Parkinson's during you know, a primary care residency and fellowship. So many times they're not sure exactly what to do. And I can tell you that you will spend a lot of time educating them um, you know, so that they can become better physicians to the future patients. Should that burden fall upon you? No, not necessarily. Um, but unfortunately, it does. Uh, I know that a few years ago, uh, gosh, COVID seems to have made me think it was a long, long time ago, but I think it was maybe two or three years ago, um, I gave a talk about Parkinson's and treating Parkinson's for all of 
the people who were in like assisted care or nursing homes, you know, they sent representatives to come to um, a meeting at the APDA. And I think the APDA uh, has that, they filmed it. So I do believe that that's available and probably on YouTube. Uh, that wouldn't be a bad resource to share with your primary care doctor. You know, if they're will, really willing to sit down and watch that, um, you know, because it's an hour long presentation, that's anybody's guess. Uh, you know, but I think that the best you can do is, you know, realize number one, that not everything is related to Parkinson's. So when you have an earache and a sore throat, or your cholesterol is high, probably not at all related to Parkinson's. Um, but if you have a suspicion that something is related to Parkinson's, let's say you've been having more trouble with your balance or walking, or that your constipation is pretty substantial, um, then it's okay to educate your primary care doctor. Like, hey, Parkinson's causes severe constipation. So I have to take this Miralax every day. Otherwise I'd never poop. Um, you know, that's for perfectly fine to do some education there. And really, if you have a question about something and your primary care doctor really isn't sure if it's related, then check in with us. And, um, you know, we'll be the first ones to tell you whether we think it's related to your PD or not. Um, young onset PD agreed, you know, it, it is harder to diagnose, harder to treat um, from a primary care standpoint, because primary care doctors have it in their head that Parkinson's happens to people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. They don't have it in their head that uh, it happens to young people in their 30s and 40s. Uh, so we frequently see that, um, you know, that people go through a long period of being misdiagnosed uh, before they finally get to a movement disorder center and, and are diagnosed properly. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, next question is from Jennifer Johnson. She says, what do I do when I'm really needing to be seen, but my doctor says they can't see me for three to six months? Uh, another excellent question. So the truth of it is, um, you know, we book out pretty far at our movement disorder center. So it's not a big surprise that they can't see you in that long. Most things with Parkinson's, once you have an established diagnosis, most things we don't have to see. Okay, most things we can talk to you over the phone or talk to you on email and figure out what's going on and treat you from that standpoint. Uh, not everything requires an in-person visit. In fact, I would say in established patients, the exam that we're doing is one of the less important things. The most important thing is sitting down with you and hearing how things are going and what the problems are and working from that regard. And those things can be done over email or over the phone. If something is a true medical emergency and you've already reached out to your primary care doctor, you know, then your only option may be to uh, go to an emergency care department. And usually if somebody tells us like, OK, I'm weak on one side of my body and, you know, my my face is droopy, then we would tell you something like, oh, my gosh, go to the emergency room. Um, in neurology practices, most people aren't going to get you in on a day or even a week's notice, unfortunately. Um, you know, if something is a big enough deal that we feel like we really need to lay eyes on this person, they've already been to the ED, um, the ED isn't sure what's going on, then sometimes we can try to squeeze people into our in-person clinic. Uh, but, you know, I can't say that over the last year when I've been primarily doing Zoom visits and there is no exam, I really don't think the quality of care has suffered um, from not having a hands-on exam for most, most people. Um, so, again, if you feel like you've already reached out via email, via phone, you've talked about these issues um, and it's still, you know, you don't feel like your questions have been answered or addressed appropriately, then, you know, you can ask to get put on a cancel list as well. And they could potentially do that. I wish there were a quick way for us to say, hey, we'll get you in in two days. But it, just with our patient population, it's probably not going to happen in most neurology offices. Certainly not with ours. OK, next question is from Melissa. Uh, Skirvan, and she says, how do I know what's a big deal? I'm worried I might not recognize something that's an indicator of a more serious issue, but I don't want to waste time going over minor issues. Um, I mean, I would say that you know if something's a big deal, if it's having a major impact on your quality of life, you know, so, um, you know, if, if you haven't pooped in a week, that's a big deal. Uh, you know, if you're getting up seven times a night to urinate, that's a big deal. If you're having falls, that's a big deal. Um, if you're having some minimal breakthrough tremor from time to time, that's not such a big deal. Um, you know, if uh, you notice that your dexterity is not quite as good as it once was, that's probably not a big deal. It can be reported at the next visit. 
Um, you know, with Parkinson's, most of the time things are not a medical emergency, which is a good thing, right? Um, so, because we don't always end up in the emergency room. Um, you know, so the things that are a big deal, you know, if you have symptoms of a stroke, like you're weak on one side of your body, if suddenly you start hallucinating, if your memory and thinking suddenly changes, so I don't mean a gradual worsening over time, I mean, boom, I can't keep things straight in my head. Um, if you're having side effects from a medicine, you know, those are all big deals, things that you want to reach out about, um, you know, but otherwise, sometimes you have to realize people with Parkinson's always will have some constipation. People with Parkinson's always will have handwriting that's not great. Um, people with Parkinson's can have some thinking and memory problems. Um, as long as things are kind of gradually progressive, then it's less of a big deal. If things are a sudden quick progression, you may need to have things like infection ruled out. Um, you know, on the list that kind of that we went through of, you know, things that we cover at various visits, hopefully we're asking about most of the things that could happen in Parkinson's, although there's always some things that pop up that aren't, um, you know, and there, then there are lots of things that are not related to Parkinson's that may need addressed. So for instance, lots of our patients have neuropathy uh, where can't, they can't feel one of their feet as well, or they have pins and needles. Um, that's usually not a medical emergency unless you have weakness, but it's certainly something that you could talk about at a visit that we'd be happy to help you with as well. So if you don't know if something's a big deal, shoot an email to your provider, you know, through the patient portal or call in and say, hey, you know, this has been going on and I just wanted to check in about it. Is there anything to do to help this? You know, is this related to Parkinson's? And it's okay to check in. Um, it's also okay, you know, the APDA has great resources as well where you can learn about various symptoms of Parkinson's, what may be related, what's not so related. Um, but I would say most people know when something's a big deal, that most people are pretty aware of when a medical emergency is happening. Um, you know, something like a stroke or a seizure, um, you know, or daily falls. I mean, you, you know in your heart, like, this is a big deal or this is a big change. Um, so I would say trust your gut uh, more than anything else if, about if something's a big deal or not. And, you know, if you're not sure, then just check in with your provider. Uh, Bill McKay asks, how to best go about getting on as a new patient with a PD specialist. Um, so, you know, you can call in um, to, first of all, you can always check with the APDA about who's a specialist in this area. Um, if you're asking specifically how to get in at uh, WashU, then you would need to call, uh, you know, our movement disorder line. I can even broadcast that here. Uh, I'm sure our secretaries will thank me profusely. It's a 314-362-6908. And uh, you could tell them that you'd like a new patient appointment. I can tell you that they'll want all of your medical records from your current neurologist. Or if you haven't seen a neurologist from whomever you have seen, your primary care doctor, sent to us um, before we would get you in as a patient. And then, of course, again, be prepared to wait. If you're not sure who's a Parkinson's specialist, I would reach out to your local American Parkinson's Disease Association. If you also look up like um, Parkinson's Center of Excellence on YouTube, you can try to find the nearest um, Parkinson's Center of Excellence. If you want to be at a movement disorder center, you can look up like movement disorder centers, Missouri, and all the ones in Missouri would pop up and you could kind of choose what's closest to you, okay? Um, but in my mind, you can't go wrong with a movement disorder center or a Parkinson's Center of Excellence in terms of knowledge. Okay. Uh, James Borden says, I'm going on nine years with DBS. Have there been any studies on good fats and brain nutrition in reducing tremors? Uh, Primal Labs has published an eye-opening book on brain nutrition. You know, I'm going to preface this by saying that I'm a bit biased here. Um, we have looked at things like vitamin D and vitamin E and coenzyme Q10 um, and really, we haven't found any supplements that are specifically helpful or not helpful. We haven't found any dietary changes that are particularly helpful. We would generally tell our patients, um, you know, to follow kind of a heart healthy Mediterranean diet, um, because that's overall, not just in people with Parkinson's, but in all human beings, that's what's best for your brain. Uh, that's what's best for your heart, um, you know, and, and eating a balanced diet. So sometimes I have patients who have lost you know, 50 pounds in the past few years, and they're down to 100 pounds. With them, I'm telling them, eat all the chocolate, eat all the ice cream, eat all the junk that you want. Um, you're not diabetic, you don't have high cholesterol, your, your blood pressure is not high, eat the junk, do whatever you have to do to keep calories. If it's not the case that we're trying to keep weight on a person, then a heart healthy diet is probably the best things that we can do. 
certainly omega-3 fatty acid um, fish oil um, is uh, important in, in all of our diets. We don't know specifically um, that that does anything to help with Parkinson's, unfortunately. All the supplements that we've looked at so far haven't really done much um, in terms of slowing the progression of the disease or helping people to do better over time. Um, so again, unless there were a big blinded study where nobody knew who was getting which supplements, it's hard to say. You know, a lot of times you end up looking at just anecdotal evidence. This, oh, this has really worked for me. And since I started this diet, I feel like things have been going better. Um, you know, but that's not really scientific. That's kind of one person's experience. So it's not an easy question to answer. Um, and there are a lot of thoughts on what can I do different with my diet. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for you in terms of what good scientific study has shown in regards to diet and Parkinson's. Okay, last question here. This is from Bradford Kitchens. And he says, how do you help direct uh, people with Parkinson's to PD user groups? Also PD exercise classes that may be difficult to find in their location. Okay, so let's address the first question first. Uh, how do we help direct people with Parkinson's to PD user groups? By PD user groups, I'm going to presume that you mean support groups. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure exactly where you're from, Bradford. Um, our St. Louis APDA puts out a quarterly newsletter um, that either comes to your email or comes, you know, a, a written copy comes in your mail. And, uh, you know, for us on the back of the newsletter is all the local support groups. If you're not from the St. Louis area, you may have to reach out to the local APDA and ask them, um, you know, do you have a newsletter? If you do, can I get on that list? Um, can I get a list of support groups near me? Um, so that's generally the way that I would go about it is to call whoever the nearest APDA support group is. And there are a lot of, because of COVID, a lot of support groups that have gone to Zoom meetings and things like this. So even if you're not close, um, Geographically, you could potentially still join a, a Zoom meeting for support. Um, sorry, I'm just seeing Laurie Morris Witt says, I don't feel so bad about eating ice cream now. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Okay, uh, and how do you find out about PD exercise classes? So this is very important because we want people exercising. Number one, if there is no exercise group close to you, you should absolutely talk to your neurologist about getting some physical therapy so that they can teach you things for a home exercise routine so that they can work on your balance, your walking, your strength, your stretching with you. Um, in terms of exercise classes, I would ask your local APDA in St. Louis again. We have, before COVID anyway, we had a lot of free exercise groups for people with Parkinson's in the area. I can tell everybody this, no matter where you are geographically. If you go to the YouTube app on your television or the YouTube app on your computer and you search for APDA St. Louis, so that's like American Parkinson Disease Association, APDA St. Louis. Okay, you search for that. And then when you click that link, one of the choices is exercise classes. Okay, um, and we have all these classes online for free, which is amazing. There's probably 20 or 30 different ones. There's some that say chair side, and those are for people who have more balance problems. You know, they're um, either sitting down in a chair doing stretching or standing up holding on to something. And then there's ones for people who don't have as much imbalance, um, you know, that aren't chair side. So you can look at that. The Tai Chi and the yoga are especially good for walking in balance. And honestly, I tell all of our movement disorder patients about this because it's free, whether they have Parkinson's or not. So I have lots of spouses who do these exercises with their um, spouse who has Parkinson's and they say, wow, this is a really good you know, workout for both of us. Uh, so I would encourage anybody to take advantage of that. OK, my dears. That was the last question uh, that we had time for today. Uh, I have enjoyed talking to you. And uh, the only tough part is that I'm not around to give everybody hugs and kisses. Um, so again, like I always do, I will tell you all to be well, tell you all to get your vaccinations, um, tell you all to applaud the APDA for putting on this presentation and, and all the presentations in the Midwest Congress despite a global pandemic. And uh, I will blow you kisses and send you hugs. Thank you very much. Take care and have a wonderful day. Hi everyone, my name is Jenny Johnson and I'm the Executive Director of the American Parkinson Disease Association Oklahoma Chapter. And on behalf of everyone at APDA, I wanna say thank you for joining us for the fourth annual Midwest Parkinson Congress hosted by the Greater St. Louis, Midwest and Oklahoma Chapters. 
Remember, there are even more great speakers tomorrow, so don't forget to tune in from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. We're so excited that we're able to share all of our wonderful and knowledgeable speakers with you. We hope you're able to learn something new and to feel more empowered in your Parkinson's journey. I wanna thank our sponsors who have helped make the Midwest Parkinson Congress possible. Let's all give a big thank you to our champion sponsors, the James and Allison Bates Foundation, the JCA Charitable Foundation, and Synovian. And I'd like to also thank our collaborator sponsors, AbbVie, Acadia Pharmaceuticals, Adamus, Boston Scientific, Delta Dental of Missouri, and Kiowa Kieran. I hope you're able to visit our sponsors page to learn more about how they support our Parkinson's community. Be sure to check them out. Once again, thank you so much for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day.